Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session of Artificial Neurosis, AI, and Psychopathology. Uh, this seminar will explore the maladies of artificial intelligence through a philosophical and psychoanalytic lens, with a focus on depictions of AI in popular culture, films, television, and science fiction literature. Uh, we will examine how the presentation of machines gone mad illuminates deadlocks of contemporary society and subjectivity, uh, while also asking how emerging technologies affect the very notion of the desiring subject. Uh, Aaron Schuster is a philosopher and writer based in Amsterdam, New York. He has written on such topics as the history of levitation, the politics of sleep, and the psychopathology of AI. He's been a fellow at the theory department of the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht, the Institute for Cultural Inquiry, ICI Berlin, and the Institute for Advanced Studies, Southeast Europe, and Rijeka, Croatia. Uh, in 2016, he was a visiting professor at the University of Chicago at the Center for Disciplinary Innovation at the Franke Institute for the Humanities. Uh, I'll now hand you over to Aaron. Okay. Okay, if that's working. So, uh, so hello, everybody. Um, I have to say, so this is my first uh, new center class. I don't know if some of you, probably more, many of you are kind of veterans of this um, format, but I'm completely brand new to it. So excuse me if the first session, I just want to introduce the theme and sort of get used to the, um, get used to the format a bit. And I don't know, I was thinking about this, that, you know, one of the things we're very used to is this critique of presence for example, coming from Derrida, coming from deconstruction. But I have to say, uh, uh, some rather naively, I rather believe in presence. So for me, like classroom presence actually means something or somehow helpful to have people in the same space, in the same situation, and having the ability to kind of react in a, in a personal space. Even though, let's say, intellectually, I understand that presence is always mediated uh, temporally, spatially, uh, uh, by language and so forth and so on. But somehow I'm still sort of a naive um, believer in presence. So I'm very curious to see what this format can bring and how we can you know, interact as a class over, over four sessions. Um, as another kind of example of this, I also you know, am surprised to learn, although this is happening more and more, that um, one of the situations you would think that could not be mediated technologically would be psychoanalysis. But in fact, there is more and more sort of therapy taking place uh, over Skype or over the internet. And that rather surprises me, but I also find it fascinating. So I even have a friend who's somehow involved in uh, psychoanalytic sessions over Skype. So you would think if there's one situation where somehow the presence, the, the, even simply the dead weight of another human being in the room meant something, it would be uh, psychoanalytic therapy. But perhaps that's not even a necessary, an absolutely necessary component. Um, so maybe the technological mediation tells us something about the, uh, the dynamics in the uh, original situation. So anyway, this is just a long sort of prefatory remark and excuse to say, I, I just want to see how this works and I have to get used to it a, a little bit. Okay. Uh, I thought for this session also, I would like to kind of so introduce myself, explain a little bit why this, why I chose this topic, why I'm working on this now. And I I'm, and I'm, would be interested if everybody would, you know, like also to introduce themselves and to explain a little bit, you know, where they're coming from and also their interest in the topic. Because I also have to say, as a kind of warning, that this is a really brand new research for me. So I'm not an expert. I really am not an expert in philosophy of technology. Um, this is something I, I just started working on. It's sort of a new project I've gotten sort of hooked on. And I was hoping to use these sessions to sort of develop this theme. But it's really in a kind of embryonic stage. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of you actually have a stronger background than me in, in issues of philosophy of technology or specifically philosophies uh, relating to uh, so philosophical issues that are being raised by artificial intelligence today. So that would also be very helpful for me if, in fact, some of you are really working on this theme or maybe more engaged in this theme than I am. Uh, let's see. To say a few more words about myself, let's see. Uh, you know, I'm also quite used to working with students from very different backgrounds. So kind of my career, I've moved a bit between the, the academy, like art academies and universities. So I'm kind of also interested to hear what background you're coming from. So I've taught like graduate, you know, graduate seminars at universities. I was at the University of Chicago 
Um, right now, I'm actually in Ithaca, New York, so I have this one-year fellowship at Cornell University. But before, I've actually spent more time teaching in, in art schools. So I was in I was at uh, the Sandberg Institute for some years in Amsterdam, also in in Bergen, Norway, and 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 other places. So I really appreciate having kind of the diversity of backgrounds. You know, different kinds of students, people coming from different professions even, um, different fields. And a lot of my own work, so my background is in philosophy, so I did my PhD in philosophy, but a lot of my work, I'm, I'm working a lot with cultural objects, uh, literature, cinema, uh, also contemporary art, and, and so on. So let me tell you how this research now fits into my general profile. I'm actually finishing, I'm finishing up a number of things I've been working on for the last couple of years, and this is just the start of something something new that just began, uh, I would say, last uh, March. Um, I'm currently finishing, so I've been working on a kind of a long-term project on uh, Jean Genet and, and the theater, specifically the theater of Jean Genet is kind of one of the most powerful uh, political theaters of the 20th century. And this is in the context of a book I'm writing with a couple of colleagues on the notion of sovereignty and kind of transformations in the notions of sovereignty, maybe, um, in some ways, especially after sort of this kind of Trump, Trump era, and going back to Genet's plays as as providing, uh, yeah, a kind of way of of, of understanding the present. Uh, so I'm looking specifically at the balcony. If you've never read any of the theater of Genet, I can really recommend it. It's one of the really incredible indeed political, sort of political theaters of the 20th century. So that's a project I've just been finishing now. Uh, I'm also working on, so right right now I'm working on a manuscript. I'm, I'm, most, I'm almost done with that on uh, what I'm calling the philosophy of tickling. It's spasm, the philosophy of tickling, which is based on an article I read. Uh, I wrote a number of years ago, a short piece that I wanted to expand for Cabinet Magazine. So I also think it's interesting for philosophers, you know, to be engaged with not always simply publishing in academic uh, journals, but I also like to have a contact with um, other kinds of publications. So Cabinet is one of, has been throughout the years one of my favorite um, magazines to work with, to collaborate with. I don't know if you're if you know them. Um, I think some of you maybe are in Berlin. Cabinet they just moved to Berlin actually. If you if you didn't know that, so. That is a that is a work um, that is a kind of history of the notion of tickling throughout throughout philosophy, um, and I almost I, I realize sort of at the while I'm at the now that I'm at the end of this project I realize th there's almost a kind of conceptual art aspect of the way I was proceeding that um, that you know like how Ulipo would use. Uh, kind of arbitrary constraints, like the artists of Ulipo would use arbitrary constraints in order to um, give them a kind of creative vehicle. Like you wouldn't write a, like you would write a novel without the, uh, without the letter E, for example, a famous um, Georges Perec novel, uh, A Void, or La Disparition. Uh, so in a certain way, like, I became interested in this theme of tickling as a very minor theme, but also almost as a kind of arbitrary constraint. Like, how could you reconstruct a history, a history of philosophy, if you were simply investigating this one small theme? And I realized I've done that a number of times. So I like to enter into philosophical topics, broader philosophical or, or, or uh, let's say, more general theoretical problems, but via some kind of minor theme that provides a kind of um, unexpected mapping. So other, other topics I've worked on, for example, are complaining, um, levitation, all these things that you can do a kind of history of, but once you connect sort of these different figures, ideas, theories, it produces a very interesting mosaic and provides a new way to enter into old, uh, old debates. So in the end, tickling really became a way for me to return to and to say something about uh, Jacques Derrida and to say something about uh, deconstruction, precisely because one of, the, uh, one of Derrida's great texts is dealing with a mime play, which is about uh, the clown who tickles his wife to death and then himself is tickled to death uh, thinking about or fantasizing about this situation. So anyway, so those are the two projects I'm finishing. And meanwhile, um, 
I somehow got interested in this in this idea of AI um, that was based on an invitation of a friend of mine to, to give a lecture about robots, robotics. And I was trying to think of how we could apply or how we could use some ideas coming from psychoanalysis to address these very contemporary debates, which are not just academic debates, but I mean, primarily now that I'm following the news, and I would recommend you guys to do that, I mean, just for this one month of this course, if you just follow whatever newspaper, The Guardian, I'm reading daily, you see that almost every other day there's some kind of article about artificial intelligence. And not just articles about, you know, what's interesting to me is there's not just articles about um, some new breakthrough or some new project, but there's a lot of sort of conceptual reflection about the nature of AI going on in the popular media. Uh, you can also see that in like popular science writers or culture writers are trying to grasp like the, you know, not only the changes that the artificial intelligence is bringing to society, but the way that artificial intelligence forces us to reconceive what we think of as, you know, specifically human subjectivity or human desire. So you can also look, for example, I was just reading that new book that's out by um, Yuval Harari, and there's long uh, discussions. I'm just pointing out that this is so a, an issue of, uh, uh, let's say, popu broad popular uh, interest or broad popular um, concern. So what I think is lacking somewhat in this discussion and in the academic discussion, the popular discussion and in academic discussion is, um, let's say, a more psychoanalytic approach or uh, an approach from the perspective of psychopathology or from the perspective of uh, mental illness. So my idea was to look at artificial intelligence from a, what we can call like a pathoanalytic perspective or from the perspective, again, of mental illness in the same way that Freud, so going back, for, I think Freud's, um, one of Freud's really revolutionary propositions, whether or not you agree with everything in psychoanalysis is, is not my interest or my concern here, but let's say one of the interesting ideas that he brought to the table um, and quite revolutionary is that you can understand human subjectivity by studying the different mental illnesses or by studying the different psychopathologies to which it is prey. So this involves a kind of reversal of perspective. So instead of sort of having a normative conception of what human subjectivity, human life, should be, and then analyzing all the different ways that you know life can deviate from this image, or all the different ways in which we can become sick, uh, in which the human life can malfunction, in which human subjectivity can fail, um, Freud argued that it's in its very failures or malfunctions that we see the essential structures of human subjectivity, or the failures and malfunctions is what illuminate uh, uh, the nature of these different structures. Um, Freud actually had a name for this that's, that's um, a little less familiar than the famous pleasure principle, but he called it at one point um, a crystal principle. Or I'm not sure if, he, I, I don't remember now if he actually uses those terms, but he uses this analogy of a crystal. So he says, you know, just like a crystal, a crystal will have kind of hidden fault lines in it that are invisible, but if you throw a crystal on the ground, it will shatter according to these invisible breakpoints. And he says human, human life, human subjectivity is just like that as well, that what mental illness allows us to see are these fractures that are there, they're present, but let's say oftentimes they're not evident, they're invisible. So that different psychopathologies are, again, they're not so much deviations, but they're exaggerations. They're exaggerations of conflicts, of crises, of problems that belong to every human being in general. So nobody escapes dealing with okay, various kinds of crises, problems, um, uh, complexes, but people deal with them differently and they're affected by them differently, quantitatively differently. So in other words, Psychopathologies present a kind of magnifying glass for understanding how the human being is put together. So we can also, I think, look at AI, AI, AI in this way, that it will actually be through the mental illnesses, or what we could call like artificial neurosis, is sort of the name I was trying to get to this. It's through the artificial neurosis that we can actually see intelligence uh, uh, emerging. Or if, so that's a speculative claim, if there is such a thing like artificial intelligence that seems to approximate or come close to 
a human intelligence, or if there's such a thing as a, a GI, artificial general intelligence, it's referred to, then that kind of intelligence should, as its, as its telltale sign, manifest some kind of deviation or some kind of mental illness. So that would be the psychoanalytic take on artificial intelligence. And I'll try to elaborate that a little bit further as we go. So the idea is at the end of the month, hopefully, we have a bit stronger notion of what, a, again, a psychoanalysis of artificial intelligence um, would look like. Uh, second point, introductory point I want to make, um, although I'm not going to dwell on this so much in this class, although it's something I, I would like to think about more, that there's kind of an interesting reversal that's, that's taking place, maybe a reversal taking place from the 20th century, early 20th century, uh, also during the period of the 1950s to present day. And that's that in psychoanalysis, was always using machinic models to try to understand the psyche. Or the psychoanalysis was always attracted from the very beginning, from Freud, from his project of 1895, from his idea of mapping the mind as a kind of neural network. The psychoanalysis always wanted to use like non-human models in order to understand the human being, in order to understand that kind of non-human, inhuman, if you want, dimension of the human being, a human being that's split into consciousness and the unconscious. So Freud himself was using models of neural networks. You can see that in his early, uh, again, in that early project for scientific psychology of 1895. Um, Lacan was also very attracted by and very interested in, you know, the emerging science of cybernetics. So Lacan thought it was more useful to try to model the human psyche based on advances made in game theory, game theory and in cybernetics. So to try to come up with a non-human, machinic idea of how the mind works would be a closer approximation of the kind of dehumanization in some ways, or inhumanization, uh, that occurs during the process of, of psychoanalytic uh, uh, therapy. That in a way, these models are helpful as opposed to more human hermeneutic models, uh, models of the mind uh, that stress like meaning in the human person. He was attracted to or wanted to use models that would somehow reduce mental functioning, or not, maybe reduce isn't the right word, but that would understand mental functioning, again, in terms of meaningless movements of signifiers or of information. Okay. Here we, today we have almost a kind of a reversal of this perspective. Now we're interested in how can the machine become human, as it were. So let's say in the 20th century, from this, from this psychoanalytic line, it was always understanding the machinic in the human. And now somehow with the, with the emergence and the you know, success, the development of AI, we're looking now at the human and the machine. And I think this is a kind of very interesting reversal to think about. The machinic and the human or the human in the machine, as it were. So what can, those, what can that reversal tell us about how we conceptualize you know, artificial intelligence, that it's not simply that artificial intelligence becomes more and more human, but we shouldn't forget that actually some of the most productive theories of the human being were trying to understand the human being in terms of a machine. Okay, so there's some kind of interesting movement that we would have to theorize more or think about between what is machinic and what is human. Okay, and the third kind of general point I just want to make via this, this, this uh, looping introduction is, what I really want to do is, uh, and I think I, I kind of spelled this out in the syllabus, is I want to look at cultural, I, so I primarily want to look at cultural representations of artificial intelligence. So I'm not going to do, I was thinking about this, that it's not, it's not so much a, uh, I'm not doing, I don't want to do a course on like the philosophy of AI as it's taught in many universities. I really want to do, in some ways, it's a bit more of a cultural studies approach that I want to look at cultural representations of artificial intelligence, but I think those can actually tell us something about the phenomena itself. Or at least we should be attentive to two possibilities. And that the cultural representations of AI maybe don't tell us much about AI, but tell us a lot about how we're thinking about our culture. So that's one. Can we look at AI as a symptom for how we're thinking through certain cultural problems? I don't think that's sufficient, but that's interesting. And the second is, can these cultural representations actually tell us something about how we're trying to conceptualize a change, a transformation in the way we, we
think of ourselves, think of ourselves as human beings in the wake of the rise of artificial intelligence. So we're mainly going to be focusing on just and just a few um, cultural representations that I think are particularly interesting. And going through the material, I realized so the one that I want to focus on the most for the whole month is that actually novella I sent you by Ted Chang. Uh, can I ask? Did, I, it's actually quite like keep forgetting. It's actually quite long, so I, I wouldn't expect you would have finished it already. But can I just ask, just to get a sense? Um, who read it already? Did you manage to read it or part of it? I don't know if you can. I did. <laughs> cool. No, just cracked it open. Uh huh. That's totally fine. I mean, actually, I was thinking, of, will we go through it this session? And I don't think so. But I would like to really ask you to finish it for the next session. That would be the main thing, to read it for the next session. I have to say, um, which book is it? It's the Ted Chang. So Ted Chang, have you heard of Ted Chang? If you haven't come across him before, you probably know him through that science fiction film Arrival. I don't know if anybody saw Arrival. Uh, Arrival is based on one of Ted Chang's stories. He's a contemporary. Um, he's a, he's he's working today. He's a contemporary author. Uh, in the, he's a, a Taiwanese American author. And, Actually, I think that the, the film, The Arrival, so that was the uh, Denis uh, Villeneuve film that he did prior to, after that, then he did the, uh, uh, the sequel to Blade Runner. But that if you watch that film, which is not a bad movie, I think, but you see that even that bends a little, adds a bit of a Hollywood, all the, all the militaristic aspects of that film are brought in, or are not in the original story. Um, in any event, so uh, Ted Chiang is considered one of the more interesting science fiction writers today. And uh, this is a novella that actually was not, or was published in a very limited run. Um, and I think it's coming out now. There's a new collection of his work coming out next year or in some months. I don't know. It's been announced. And this novel is being um, republished. But in any event, it's from 2010, The Life Cycle of Software Objects. I really think that's one of the most interesting uh, stories I've, I've read about uh, artificial intelligence. And it raises all sorts of interesting questions. And it also, you know, I really want to focus on um, the problem of love and the relationship of artificial intelligence and love and how artificial intelligence uh, will mediate, mediates human uh, romantic attachments and what it means to love an AI, for instance. So I think that that's, I really want to focus on that uh, novel. So I'd say, please definitely read that for next time. And the whole next session, we will just focus on that. And actually, one of the, so one of the things I would like to get out of this uh, short course is to produce like a really good reading of that novel. That would be um, kind of sufficient for me if we do nothing else. I would really like to produce like just a good reading of this novel to really understand what's at stake into what's at stake in it and all the different uh, issues it raises. Let me add um, also one other kind of interesting reference. I mean, while you're reading the novel, what you can think about the the title is already kind of interesting. This idea of a life cycle of a software object. So. The idea of a life cycle, you know, what life cycle is he describing? Because it's a story that's about artificial intelligence. It's actually about AI developing as a kind of pet. It's kind of close to like a Tamagotchi or something. Like the AI starts off as a kind of commodity, but as a kind of pet. So what is the life is it the life cycle of these entities, these artificial intelligence entities, how they develop? Is it also a kind of capitalist life cycle? It's the life cycle of companies, which is also very interesting that he analyzes uh, AI from the perspective of its status as a product and how it develops as a commodity. So it's the life cycle also of these um, companies. Uh, it's the life cycle of their products and how they take on a life of their own. Could also be the life cycle of the human beings, of the individuals involved. One of the more interesting, just to make a leap, and this is quite a leap, but I think um, one of the most interesting science fiction movies of the last years is by Shane Carruth. If you're if you're familiar with him, he's an independent American filmmaker, and he did a film some years ago called uh, Upstream Color. Did anybody watch that? I'm just curious. Upstream Color is also interesting to think about in terms of this story, even though it's a really very different. But it's also a film about like 
a life cycle, like charting a kind of life cycle. Um, in his case, it's the life cycle of a certain kind of parasite. Uh, it's a parasite that traverses, in a way, traverses the human being and inserts the human being into a broader circuit or a broader cycle of which it's not aware. So in a way, decenters human experience. It's a parasite that goes through the plant world, through orchids, through pigs, through humans. Okay. I would really also recommend that's that's just a second that's just a kind of I'm not going to focus on that but it's a kind of secondary um, something to think about and it's just really a brilliant and beautiful film. So upstream color, somehow thinking about this theme of the idea of uh, charting a life cycle. So charting a life cycle, um, uh, I think uh, Shane Carruth and Ted Chang have this in common in these two in these two um, in these two works. So again, okay. Just to emphasize that, I really want to focus so on that novel, and I would like to produce like a, a good reading of that to understand what's at stake um, in his conception of artificial intelligence, but the relation of artificial intelligence to love and desire. Okay, and then broadly, how I conceive the syllabus or how I'm thinking of this problem is looking at AI through. So again, through the window of psychopathology. On the one hand, you have the most obvious. So I think the most obvious uh, way in which AI is, is imagined in popular culture, and of course, that's the, psych the psychotic, the psychotic AI or the AI psycho killer model. You see that in films like, like Terminator, also to some extent in 2001, uh, The Matrix, that the robots will become conscious and, and kill and murder us all. Uh, I think this is the least, so far as maybe the least interesting or the least creative um, vision of a kind of neurotic uh, artificial intelligence of so this kind of psychotic psycho killer. But even here, I want to I want to try to analyze what might be interesting and at stake there. So the one the one um, text I want to focus on is this, so that's a much shorter story, like ten pages or something. But I want to look at a classic story by Harlan Ellison. Uh, Harlan Ellison, who just died um, this year, I believe. He just died recently. But one of the great sort of science fiction authors from the sort of classical era, 60s, 70s, 80s, was probably most famous for penning some of the best of the old uh, Star Trek, in fact. So this Harlan Ellison story is fantastic. I mean, it's really a great, um, it's really a great piece of, of fiction. So I want to look at that as a kind of portrait of the mad, the kind of psych psychotic or the psycho killer AI. I want to look at then what I consider a much more interesting, provocative uh, image of AI is the depressed, the depressed robot, which has been not, you know, probably the most famous representation of that is coming from Douglas Adams' um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Marvin the Paranoid Android, who's really Marvin the Depressed Android. So I want to take a look at what would be at stake in the idea that instead of rebelling, wanting to somehow surpass, replace the human race, or rebelling against their human masters, which is what so many robot narratives are about, uh, probably a more cruel and simply more realistic, more ideologically attuned portrait of AI would be that the robot workers would simply become depressed, complacent, and maybe, maybe stop working. We could even imagine a Bartleby-esque AI, just who would prefer to stop working, something like that. So, so, so the psychotic AI, the depressed AI, and then what we're going to be focusing on so today to, and, and next week, this idea of uh, artificial intelligence in love. So those are the kind of bases um, that I want to that I want to touch on. Okay, um, maybe at this point. So now that I've given a little introduction, maybe at this point this would be good to get. Um, yeah, and in, uh, maybe each of you could introduce yourselves. Just tell me so your name, where you're from, um, if you're if you're in school, if you're not in school, and and a little bit maybe just your research interest in this, um, or what background you bring to this. Like, why are you interested in 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 uh, in this theme? Um, yeah. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Could you kind of moderate that? Yeah. Yeah, what I'll do yeah, is what I'll just, I'm gonna, we're going to go from uh, right to left, okay? okay? Is that working so far? Can you hear me? Is the, is the connection working? I, I can hear you perfectly, thank you. All, all is good? Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to ask maybe could uh, Alberto possibly, could uh, Alberto possibly please uh, jump in if Alberto is free? Hi. Hi. 
So my name is Alberto. I'm from Mexico City, and uh, I'm an I am a industrial designer. I work for a for a consultancy. It's kind of a design and technology consultancy. Um, so kind of my work is to uh, help uh, corporations to uh, understand better uh, channels for communicating with customers and, and stuff like that. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, my my interest is uh, to understand on a, on a high level how how these uh, new technologies. Uh, can affect us or, or modify the way we see the world. Uh huh. You know. So let me. Did you have a chance to already look at then the the novel? Yes. Yes, I finished. Okay, because I think that that would actually speak a lot to you. Because what I think one of the things. I mean, again, we'll we'll talk about this more, especially next week. But one of the things I think that's so interesting is that his focus on the business side aspect. Of yes. It. And I actually think that that's really interesting about it that he's not just writing about artificial intelligence either from an abstract theoretical perspective or just from the perspective of the robots but he actually focuses on how the robot you know how they are embedded in a business framework and that that actually tangibly affects like materially affects their development and their reception yes very interesting that part so i think that's very interesting and especially if i for those who haven't read i mean the, the really the really interesting twist is his idea i think that's a really novel conception of what it would mean for an ai to liberate itself because we know so many ai fictions are about robots um, liberate you know wanting to liberate themselves so if you're following you know even most contemporary visions like in uh, westworld for example you know what would it mean for the robots to become like independent autonomous actors or to gain some kind of recognition and Ted Chiang has a really fascinating proposal there. He says that the, the, the pathway to the liberation of the robots will be their corporatization. That robots will become persons like corporations become persons. And I think nobody else has thought of such a weird, um, both subversive and in, in some ways maybe horrifying image of what autonomy for an artificial intelligence could be. So in the end, it's a debate about they would become independent, that they would actually become incorporated. Anyway, but okay, that's cool. No, I think for you that that would be an interesting story, precisely because the, you know, the business doesn't remain simply external to it, but like, in some ways, the whole drama around the business aspect is the most interesting part of the, is the most interesting part of the story. Yeah, it's very interesting how economic factors affect and how right. what consumers want like the sex stuff and, and right. It's very interesting to see that. Okay, so, okay, so we'll come back to that. Good, and you know now. Sorry, now that I'm thinking about it, you know. Um, well, I'll, okay, I'll repeat this later. But I, I was gonna say, I would like like people to to write like very sh very short. I'm gonna ask you to do very short writing assignments, like a page or something. But to to write some of your reactions to the to the um, to the things we're gonna be discussing. But okay, I'll I'll talk about that when, when we after we do introductions. Okay, cool. Well, nice to meet you. Uh, Thanks. Okay, so maybe we could go next to Andrea, if Andrea is free. Yes, yes, I am. I apologize for the noise behind me. If you want, I can ride. I don't know what's best. Where are you? I'm in the, I'm in university, and uh, because I'm, I was lost here, so I couldn't get get it back home. So to go back. University home. where? Yeah, yeah, I can listen. Yeah. Where, where, what university? Oh, we were goldsmiths in London. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll start my MA in cultural studies next week. So I was here for the induction meeting, so to meet the professors and stuff like that. Um, anyway, I'm a, I'm a graduate in philosophy, and uh, my my uh, my bachelor uh, dissertation regarded the, the, the thought of uh, Bernard Stiegler uh, and uh, uh, Simon got intersected with uh, the thought of, uh, of some com concepts of indi individuation, Simon Gaon, and then the cross the, cons the paradigm actually of um, algorithmic governance because I'm, I'm interested in uh, both epistemological and political uh, implication of AI. So 
So yeah, that's it. I mean, I'm really um, excited to discuss all this course also because you suggested as a readings um, the, the, the one of uh, um, the winner of winner the, the cybernetic team. and also because of, you suggested uh, as a further reading uh, the the one of uh, uh, Catherine Ailes I think Ailes is her name the, because she I think she she like invented the term of uh, non conscious non consciousness I mean she's and I believe she's one of the first uh, um, thinker that started using this this, um, uh, this concept and saw also some poten potentialities in it. So that's it. Cool. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I got it. Um, so one of the things I'm still um, thinking about, and maybe that would be for the very end. So. I was trying to decide if I integrate Hales or not. One of the things I'm interested in, in general, so I've actually been looking at um, Catherine Hales's most recent book called Non-Thought. And I can say one of the things I'm interested in is, uh, you know, that I don't think has been really discussed very much is what would be the relationship between these new, uh, you know, just let's say in the last 10, 20 years, new concepts of the non-conscious and let's say the more classical, but I don't think it's classical at all, but okay, let's call it that, the more classical, like psychoanalytic understanding of an unconscious. One could say that today, it's fairly uncontroversial to claim that the, 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 the uh, domain of thinking is much broader than the domain of consciousness. You could say, today that's, I would say that's quite uncontroversial. Maybe a century or two ago, the case was a bit different. But almost everybody will agree that thought is a broader category than like conscious thought or conscious reflection. But then what is the nature of that non-conscious cognition? For example, that Hales is one of the primary, one of the most interesting theorists of. And how can we relate that then to, in psychoanalysis from the very start, assume that indeed there's always, there's a form of thinking going on a form of thinking that's not conscious thinking, but a form of thinking that's expressed also in my body, and a form of thinking that's connected to desire. Today, with the study of like non-conscious cognition, do we connect that to desire or not? It's an open question, but I would like to I would I'd like to think or think more about the the connection between the unconscious, let's say, and the non-conscious. So let's see, let's see if we get there. Or maybe we're going to get there in a kind of circuitous way a little bit via, again, via looking at some of these cultural representations, cinema, novels, and so on, that I think are actually raising these questions. You'll also see that in the Chang. The question is, do these AIs, these, the Digians, you know, do they have desire or not? I think one of the interesting things in the Chang is he treats that idea he treats the idea of would AIs have desire or would they have a kind of pleasure principle in a kind of very nuanced way. That he says they do have a kind of reward system and in order to be intelligent the way that they are intelligent, they need to have a kind of reward system or we could call it a pleasure principle. They need to have a kind of pleasure principle. I think, uh, you know, today you either get, uh, what about, uh, representations of AI either go in one of two directions. Either they're, you know, computing but without any desire, so without the capacity to set goals. Okay, that's that's actually the kind of, that's actually the kind of most dominant, or the, let's say that's that's what most people are thinking about. So AI is not setting goals for itself. So in other words, the, the people who are, who are writing about this criticize very strongly, like science fiction, representation they are or you have the idea you know you see a film like um, ex machina and all of a sudden the ai is like a full-blown kind of desire you know it's just like a desiring subject and kind of uncannily human so again to to make a to make a how to say to make a kind of a pitch for this chain book i think what's so interesting is he ma he manages a position halfway in between the you know halfway between them he tries to think that an artificial intelligence would have some kind of goal-directed behavior, or would have a kind of pleasure system, but a pleasure system that's also but that's also kind of embryonic, in a way, kind of primitive, manipulable, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, but I agree. I think that's you know, 
keep in mind these questions. I honestly, I have to think about this more. If we, if we read, if we, if I sign a text of Hales, if we read that, it will be at the end. It would be the last session. That's where we would get. But I'm still, you know, myself figuring it out. Let me say. Um, but I'm interested. I'm interested in her. You know, just to let you. Know, I'm interested in her precisely because I think that the dialogue with psychoanalysis somehow is missing. And and I'm trying to understand kind of why, if that's if that's a necessary omission, like if it's really articulating something very different, or if it's possible that there's a strong dialogue, or maybe there's a contradiction or a critique. I'm not sure yet. But okay, but uh, good. I would you know just I would just encourage you to keep these. Um, yeah, keep those issues in the back of your mind, and you can bring them up, you know, during that. Yeah. Okay, perhaps we'll move on to the uh, next person then. Can I ask with the, with the, sorry to ask a boring technical question, but um, if I, if, can we sort of, can people talk at the same time? I mean, not that I want people to talk over each other, but like, if I'm talking, can, can, can the person I'm talking to reply to me or? That's absolutely no problem at all. Once people unmute themselves, their audio is, is, is in the space. Uh, what I would just say is that uh, with everyone talking at the same time in a digital digital medium, it can become a big cacophonous. But uh, by all means, let's not inhibit any uh, discussions, right? Okay. Cool. So if we're, I, I'm so, I just kind of want to chat with each of you individually, like a little bit like this, and then you, you know you can reply to me or whatever. Okay. 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 So maybe we can uh, move to uh, Artemis now. Is Artemis there? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So my name is Artemis, um, I come from Greece, I'm an architect. I don't have any specific background in technology, but in my diploma project, I created a museum for everyday use, let's say, of everyday use and for everyday use. So I had some, I designed some installations that um, some of them were using technology to analyze the way we inhabit the space so when i saw the seminar i found it really interesting and that part that you mentioned that in artificial intelligence um this part of psych psychoanalysis is missing so i find it like really interesting to get in in this part um ex uh, coincidentally i saw the film uh again after many years um also the space odyssey i think the machine there <laughs> is another example of how uh mm. it shows like um part of sentiment and yeah so i'm excited to start the session and uh, i hope uh, we have many readings because i'm interested and i don't have any background on that i'm just mm. curious you know, I mean, what you point out, I think, is really also correct. I mean, somehow that that representation of how uh, was it how nine thousand? No, I can't remember. The the computer in, in two thousand one, a space odyssey, is somehow like became, I mean, myth mythic, mythological, in some way, but also kind of prototype for our idea that the you know the AIs are dangerous and that they're prone to their own kind of psychosis. And yeah. there's some extremely touching in that film also the end when he's forced to dismantle the AI and it's mm -hmm. going mad, you know, just singing this kind of strange lullaby to itself. And it was considered so, really uh, old. I mean, it was in the 60s. <laughs> so exactly. it's amazing. Yeah. So I think that that's also one of the paradigm, I mean, really one of the paradigmatic figures that, that more contemporary fictions are, are in some way, in some ways in dialogue with or reacting against. Kubrick's vision mm -hmm. and maybe you noticed did anybody so I uploaded I sent you guys three films actually I sent the, and one of them was the Godard awesome. alphabet and did you notice actually that Godard invents that aesthetic before Kubrick if I if, if my dates mm. are correct that, that actually that the that the um, alpha 60 alpha 60 you know is, is what is that kind yeah. of just and actually that's what Kubrick will take on in how with how so I think even Godard is inventing this aesthetic of the like, you know, the mad yeah. robot. It's just one eye. I think the one Where was sixty-nine Godard's. I think, and, and Kubrick was sixty-five, or maybe it's the opposite. It Godard, doesn't matter, Godard, but the connection is Godard is sixty-four. 
Oh, okay. Well, yeah. we're in digital media. Can somebody look that up? Godard, I'm pretty sure, is 64, and I think the Kubrick is some years after. Mm -hmm. That was, this would be a good offer. Somebody should just do a little, uh, send me a quick message, you know, like. It's probably the one kind of, this kind of classroom environment. You see a 68 thing. This is the one classroom environment. It's not obnoxious if somebody is looking up something on Google while you're speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, no, indeed. So Godard was, was actually, I think, in, in some ways, pioneer. Mm. I don't know for sure if Kubrick was uh, consciously taking over that image, but I really wouldn't be surprised. 65, okay, thank you. I thought it was 64. So anyway. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so I, you, that could also be, you know, if this was a longer course or more comprehensive, if I wanted a more comprehensive syllabus, for sure you would watch um, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. The other thing I can say about that film that I think is interesting, if you want to look at like the clinical roots of that computer, that I think Kubrick is very much in dialogue with the popular theory of schizophrenia at the time, which is coming from Gregory Bateson. And Gregory Bateson, so he was also very much in dialogue with cybernetics and systems theory. And he developed this idea that schizophrenics become schizophrenics because they can't integrate contradictory pressures coming from their environment. And so they develop as their symptom a different, a kind of third world, a new world, a delusional universe, in order to mediate between demands that are simply contradictory and they can't resolve in any other way. This is what he called the double bind. Yes, okay, somebody already. So this is what was called the double bind theory of, um, of uh, psychosis. Um, the critique of this theory, of course, was that there's double binds in life all over the place. You know, the classic double, if you don't know a double bind, I think there's a joke, uh, there's a Jewish joke about the, the mother gives her son like a red tie and a blue tie, you know? And so the son wears, you know, the next day when she sees him, the son is wearing the blue tie. She says, oh, what is it? You didn't like the red tie? So this kind of situation where you're screwed no matter what you do, it's a double bind. You can't, you can't no matter what you do in the situation, you've do, you're, you're doing the wrong thing. The idea that the schizophrenic is somebody deeply affected by such a double bind and develops a delusional, so this is what happens to Hal, actually, that Hal has competing orders. Um, I actually haven't watched the film in the last uh, year, so it's not super fresh in my mind, but he has this kind of, it turns out that he has one mission order, and then the company interjects like another order, and he can't synthesize these orders. It's like a double bind, and he goes mad, something like that. So that film is, is already, you know, it's, let me say, um, how, how can I put it? Uh, it's not just me making up this idea that we can look at um, artificial intelligence through a psychoanalytic lens. I think from the early days, it was in dialogue with psychoanalysis. And I think how you know the 2001 is an example of that. Or if you do if you do some research into the history of cybernetics, uh, you'll see that you know that cybernetics was also somehow in dialogue with psychoanalysis. How has to what was how has to keep the mission? What was it? How has to keep the mission a secret? Sorry, I lost the. When they at the very end of the movie, another at the very when when uh, when they disconnect Hal, they find a secret videotape that was recorded. Um, like the tr what the true mission is. I, I always read it as like Hal's unconscious. Um, you know that he did not have access to. Uh, I don't know, but um. It, I, it is really interesting. I mean, that's really interesting. I mean, we can go. We can come back to this or keep it in mind. I just, uh, I guess, the only, um, yeah, the only point I want to make is indeed. I think the if you want to do the, the background of this is somehow that that science fiction is in dialogue with this Gregory Bateson theory of schizophrenia, and that the computer suffers because it has contradicting orders that it can't it can't synthesize except in a kind of mad or neurotic form that neuroticizes the machine, right? Hal is neuroticized precisely because somebody manipulates his programming in such a way that the orders conflict. So in any event, the, the, the take, what I, what I kind of want to take away from this again is that somehow this theme of like AI, madness, it's there from the beginning in culture, but also in the conversations so that are developing in the history of cybernetics 
So that's also why I was assigning that chapter. Nobody read. I'm also surprised. In, you know, as far as I know, nobody reads that chapter. So there's a chapter of that classic book on cybernetics by Norbert Wiener, and one of the chapters is cybernetics and psychopathology. And so when we look at that, I'll also mention that the, the biographical information is not uninteresting, that Wiener himself, like his brother suffered from schizophrenia, he was always worried that he himself would be mad, and he's writing about schizophrenia in computer networks. So anyway, okay. So, you know, you can also, let me say, we're, we, since, you know, since it's a limited course, I just want to look at some specific, you know, we'll look at Godard, uh, what am I? What, what did I give you? The Godard, this Black Mirror episode we'll talk about later, the novel. Uh, I also assigned. Did anybody look at that yet? I find it. Um, I find it actually quite brilliant in a way and very bizarre that that um, comic video. It was actually, it was actually just shown last June or July, so it's very recent from Adult Swim. This Queen battle walkthrough. What is it called? Final Final Deployment Four. I'm. Did anybody see that already? Can I just get a show of digital hands? Yeah, it's great. It's great. I'm not gonna. I, I kind of want to look at that. Don't worry, but it's not for today. I think we we would talk about that like in the third session, like the third and fourth sessions. But just it's about a half hour long. But maybe just to give a little pitch for that. I forget their names. It's by the. It's from this comedy channel, American comedy channel, um, uh, series called Adult Swim, which is on very late at night. Aaron, I need can I just interject there for one moment. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, that's just uh, we're kind of going through the roll call now and getting people to introduce themselves. So maybe let's uh, get that out of the way first. And then oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I just have a tendency to just I'm just riffing off of when you. If, sorry, when you when you're when you're introducing yourselves and telling me about your interests, I'm just kind of riffing off of them a little bit and reconnect. But okay, you're right. Let's just go back to okay. Of course, no problem at all. So uh, the next person up would be David. David. Uh, is David there? David. Um, let's see. Hi there. Can you? There we go. Hi, hey. Um, I'm an autodidact. I've been studying, uh, learning about posthumanism and uh, transhumanism and artificial intelligence for a very long time. Very okay. interested in it. Um, I grew up wanting to be a cognitive scientist, so I uh, read a lot of Daniel Dennett's work and um, right. learned about the, uh, what is it, the paranoid schizophrenic um, uh, artificial intelligence named Perry. So I remember that really stuck with me. Uh, What's the, sorry, to, what was that again? That paranoid, what, can you tell us something a little bit? About yeah, 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 sure. Like, um, yeah, there, there was this, uh, it's been been quite a while, but I uh, I grew up reading um, Douglas Hofstadter, or yeah, Douglas Hofstadter and Daniel Dennett. And they wrote this book called The Mind's Eye, which is like the uh, kind of 1980s, really hopeful look at our artificial intelligence and cognitive science. Mm -hmm. um, right before what they call the uh, the AI winter, and um, so it's this book of essays, some fiction, um, all sorts of stuff. And one of the pieces is about this um, computer program. So one of the earliest artificial intelligence programs was called Eliza, which is a um, like a, a psychotherapist that you know kind of asks questions, and it's um, and it was very simplistic. And so this was. The next level, this more complicated thing um, that I mean, it's a paranoid schizophrenic. So it's um, right. that was something that's always stuck with is, me. Is this something that? Um, so again, to underline that I'm, uh, you know, that again, this is a new. You know, when you're teaching, yeah. you can either do, you can either sort of teach what you've been working on for years and you know backwards and forwards, or or you just start with something brand new. So this is again quite brand new for me. This topic. Oh wow, the Perry is like, was there an article called like artificial paranoia? Probably. This I is, I, this... This. After <laughs> I came up with this like artificial neurosis and then I saw, oh, there's a classic article from, I think maybe from the seventies called artificial yeah, paranoia. Yeah. But I haven't had a chance to really look into that. And I think it's about this. I think it's about this program that came after Eliza. See, That's, that this is would be it. Path of research that actually we're not going to go into. We're, I'm oh well, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm just because of our lim time limitation, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting other pathway that you can look at the history of um, computer science 
And you can see that one of the early, like, kind of AI, very primitive AIs, but precisely was a therapist, actually. That, like, you know, they started thinking of the therapeutic potentials, and that's something that is actually being much discussed today: the use of AIs for psychotherapy. Maybe we'll talk about this a little bit, but yeah, but, um, I got it. So I okay, that's interesting. I'm going to look at that, but I think that there's an article called "Artificial Paranoia," and it's about this Perry program. Anyway. But okay, so you know this, you know this, um, let me see, this kind of history via um, computer science. Um, yeah, something something like that. I've just been interested in it, reading about it for uh, two decades now, so. <laughs> cool. cool, and the Dennett, of course, is also, you know, you can also think of that, in, in, you know, in, in connection with some of our readings, because I think yeah. that they bring up, I mean, these debates, like, in... it's funny that, you know, maybe this research also touches on a very, very old, in the old, old day, like when I was a teenager, I was, uh, I was really into computer programming. I completely lost that somehow. <laughs> but, you know, when I was like a teenager or early 20s, somehow I was very interested in um, computer science and I just lost that interest. So maybe this is a way of me going back to this um, anyway. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, move on to Hunter next. Hunter there. Okay. Thanks very much, David. Yeah. Hunter. Yeah, hi. Look at that. Um, I'm Hunter. I am primarily a musician, composer. I have a um, metal band that's been pretty active for a while. My current project is um, an opera. Um, very interested in the um, kind of having a practice that combines music and philosophy. I've written a lot of philosophical essays. Um, I'm interested in subjectivity, the relationship between music and subjectivity. Uh, my background is in philosophy. I you know, have a degree in analytic philosophy, I went to Columbia, and I've spent a lot of time in Lacanian circles in New York. Um, surrounding uh, like the journal Lacanian Inc. I've mm -hmm. got some stuff for that. And um, yeah, L Lacan and Deleuze are kind of my main philosophical reference points. I really like your book on the two of them. So that's a good clarifying. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, this, um, you know, more recently I've been interested in this kind of new philosophical horizon or trend or whatever this passage from sort of using uh, the theory of cybernetics and things like that kind of impressionistically to address subjectivity the subject to kind of the opposite that kind of spearheaded by Nick Land and so on of, of kind of the, the reverse engineering mm -hmm. of the subject and um, you know, efforts to use Kantian notion of freedom, you know, how, how, how could the Kantian notion of freedom be programmed or something like that. Um, and yeah. I like that formulation, by the way. That's something we definitely will come back to this idea of a, could you program freedom? Yeah. <laughs> could you, you know, could you program something? I mean, the paradox there is could you program something that it would seem by definition, is not programmable. Freedom should not be programmable precisely because it should be free from determination. So I, I think that, that that's a paradox I just want to dwell on in different forms. Um, we'll come back to it today. I think that that's the paradox of the Black Mirror episode. That's why I like that particular episode so well. That sure. you can compute something that by definition should be uncomputable. Um, can we determine something that by definition should resist determination? Can that be integrated into a program system, something that escapes systematization? Right, and, and in a way you could say obviously it can't, you know, because freedom is the ability to solve problems algorithmically, you know, maybe. Um, That's an that would be an interesting definition. That would be an interesting way of approaching that. Uh -huh. and, and I'm very, I'm, I'm especially curious what you have to say about Lacan. In the context of AI, because because a lot of people have used Deleuze. I think this this kind of came out of Deleuzean studies. You know, the, the notion of the inhuman 
Um, but you know, like Lacan, yeah, there's this notion that the subject is perhaps like an absolute transcendental horizon that, you know, that, that the progress of science would never be able to, um, touch and, um, or, or maybe that's what Lacan says, but, but, but like, um, I'm, I guess that's the same thing of same, same question. Uh, can you program freedom? Right. Okay. You know, um, I want to say something. I just want to say something about that. Um, not about the specific question, but about so how I was trying to think of how to do this class. So there's a couple, you know, again, the focus, most of our readings are these like kind of cultural, you know, films, novels, etc. So I want to look at those themes via the cultural representations. But, you know, we could have and I can I might still think about this again for the last, especially maybe for the last session, because I was thinking of trying to incorporate like Hales, Hales' approach to the non-conscious cognition. I was thinking, is there a possibility, could we read some psychoanalysis on this? But I was trying to figure out how, you know, what we could actually read um, of Lacan. So I'm gonna keep that in mind. Like, actually my initial approach was that I wanna bring in some psychoanalytic ideas, but I wasn't gonna propose that we just sit down and read like some, some, uh, some texts of Lacan, for instance. But I might, like I said, I'm still developing this as it goes along. So we see how it goes for like the last session. For sure, I want to bring in some psychoanalytic ideas, but it would have been kind of different to just, uh, you know, one could imagine a class where you just, what did Lacan say about machines, for instance? Um, you see what I'm, does it, you see what I'm saying? Or Sure, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I would love to take that approach. Okay, <laughs> so okay, but I maybe I'll okay, but if there's interest in that, maybe I'll think about that more. How to I can be more maybe precise about that because, because indeed, and that might be you know surprising, um, for some people coming to psychoanalysis because I think today probably our image of psychoanalysis is, is really of a kind of humanistic discipline. Because if psychoanalysis is under pressure today, it's probably from like drug therapies. So if psychoanalysis can defend itself against like drug therapies, it's to say like, it's not to invalidate drug therapies or like pharma, you know, psychopharmacological treatments of mental illnesses. It's not to invalidate them, but to say that there's kind of an irreducible human dimension, that we also have to talk to human beings, that it's not just a matter of manipulating sort of biochemistry, but it's also about how you subjectivize your experience. Or how you understand your personal history, et cetera, et cetera. That's what psychoanalysts you could you could imagine say today. But it's interesting. It, Lacan's approach, like in the 1950s, was to say when we speak about subject, I'm not speaking about some deep core of the human being, or I'm not speaking about kind of the deepest elements of your personality. I'm speaking about something that's really mechanical and something that can't be integrated into your subjective experience. So the best way of thinking about that is in machinic terms. That's interesting, I think. One, one other small thing on that note, like I do think that you know, psychoanalysis is often associated with sort of a refusal to optimize. Uh -huh. um, and right. when you think about that and that connection, if, if AI could be not optimized or something, well, we, AI look, inherently optimizes. Look, I think that's a, fan, I, actually, I think that's a, that's a, that's an excellent um, intervention. And that's actually precisely what am I, that's really what I want to explore like that um, the AI discourse is so much about indeed the optimization of algorithms for example and couldn't you say that the human being is somehow a, a, a weirdly paradoxically a successfully de-optimized creature like the success of the human intelligence is the fact that in some ways it's not optimized for any specific goal and that human beings are even kind of bad at achieving goals, they said, in some ways. But the, something deeply successful about human subjectivity is that it's de-optimized or it has a certain kind of goallessness. And one of the ways this goallessness is expressed is precisely through aesthetics, through aesthetics and art. Also, psychoanalysis, weirdly, so, okay, I'm riffing here a little bit, but psychoanalysis is also kind of a very interesting therapeutic practice because it questions the very nature of having a goal for the therapy. So psychoanalysis questions radically the idea of what it means to be a happy individual or a healthy individual. Whereas most therapies have a stronger normative conception, like a goal you're striving towards. 
where psychoanalysis forces you to confront the very notion of what it means to pose a goal. What are these goals that you think you're aiming at? In a way, the human desire, you could say, is a kind of de-optimizing de function in some, in some sense. Um, so one of the kind of paradoxes that I want to think about, it's the same paradox of, you could say, it's another way of stating this idea of how could you somehow program freedom is, um, you know, could a computer, could you have a computer model that actually models its own breakdown or that models that in a way gains a new kind of optimization by not optimally attaining its initial goal? Actually, I think that's what's at stake in um, the, the Hang the DJ episode. That it's a kind of simulation of love, but for it to work, it has to simulate the breakdown of its own simulation. Anyway, we can, we'll, we can come back to that. But I, I'm sorry, it's just to say, I think that's a, I like the way of putting this question. Like, what would it mean in artificial intelligence that doesn't, uh, what would it mean in, in, intel, in artificial intelligence, yeah, that doesn't, uh, obey or isn't isn't designed according to more commonsensical ideas of what it means to like achieve a goal anyway but just keep this in mind i mean i i, I this is very much like the question in my mind like looking at these different texts and i will think more about i will think more about maybe integrating either i can give you a recommendation for some specific lacan text to read so I could just, you know, send you an email or integrate that into the, into the syllabus, or maybe doing a little separate, um, at least summary, if that's helpful, of like La what, why Lacan was interested in, in machines and cybernetics in the 1950s. That was really, in some ways, a very unique philosophical stance he took. Okay, perhaps maybe we can move okay. on to... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so maybe Thanks. if we can move on to Jean-Paul next. Is that possible? Yeah. Is Jean-Paul there? Jean-Paul. Maybe just a moment, uh, Jean-Paul. Um, okay, perhaps Jean-Paul can't. Hi. Oh, hey. Hello, Hello Jean-Paul. Okay. Hi, guys. Jean-Paul, I'm from Toronto. I am uh, not a student at the moment. And, but my interest in this, I have a background in philosophy. I have a degree from Trent in philosophy. My background is Deleuze, formally, but over the last decade or so, I've been quite taken in by psychoanalysis, even though I keep up with the object-oriented ontologists. Um, but really, yourself, Aaron, Frank Ruda, Slavoj Zizek have been very influential to me over the last little while. I don't have any writing going on at the moment. However, my interest is, is uh, quite strong. Regarding this class, I don't think we will be able to access AI without framing our questions in psychoanalytic terms. Uh -huh. um, as in paradoxical terms, for instance, as you mentioned. Oh, I think I just lost you. Before. Um, uh, what I hope is that uh, throughout this class, either confirm or disconfirm. Hi. Sorry, could you just repeat the last Am bit? I still there? The connection just dropped for a second, sorry. Ah, just uh, regarding my interest in the class, um, it's connected to my ongoing interest in uh, being able to speak clearly and with a uh, certain, uh, you know, authority in a way about what's going on and the most important things that are taking place uh, today. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to do that without psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And regarding AI, um, I don't think we'll have access to AI and being able to understand it without psychoanalysis. Um, what to get from this class is to either confirm or disconfirm what I think is happening. Um, I don't have any writing going on at the moment, but uh, again, I'm just collecting as much information as I can, as many great references as I can, and uh, working towards something. Cool. Cool, that sounds great. <laughs> well, good. Um, Yes, we keep in mind this psychoanalytic background of AI. I guess it could be also not only the questions we bring to it, but like I was mentioning maybe through the Kubrick film that, or, or the example of Eliza, that somehow from its very origins in the beginning, it's already kind of sp itself in, involved in a kind of dialogue um, with psychoanalysis. So. Okay. Uh, yes. Sorry. 
No, no, please, Jean, uh, Jean Paul, please go ahead if you have something to say. Forgive me. I just wanted to say that, yes, exactly. Um, I think that as we move closer to an understanding of AI, we get more just really into uh, what psychoanalysis already understood about subjectivity. And if there's any sort of horror or something to be warned about or any kind of uh, uh, thing to be to fear about AI, different or stronger than what tell us about subjectivity. I want to know if I can, throughout this class, I want to know if I can confirm or disconfirm those uh, suspicions. Sorry, sorry, I, I'm sorry to do this to you, but could you just say the, because the last thought sounded interesting and you just dropped out again really fast. For me. I'm sorry. Um, the, the, the last kind of hypothesis you had, I wanted to hear. I, I, if there is anything to fear or any sort of um, uh, worries we have about AI, how it's growing and where it is going, I don't think it can be any different than what uh, psychoanalysis can tell us about subjectivity. I, uh, I think if there's violence, if there's something uh, to worry about, it will, uh, it won't be any, can't be any worse or uh, differently defined than how psychoanalysis would be able to, or perhaps already has interpreted subjectivity, aspects of subjectivity. Right. And maybe I hope throughout this course, maybe I can confirm or disconfirm those suspicions. Right. You know, you make me think of, let me just, I just want to make two general comments that maybe also help yeah. to frame the course. Did you, you just, your, your remark makes me think of something. Um, one would be, you know, it's very difficult. So let's say as, as, as thinkers, as diagnosticians, in a way, it can be very difficult to try to um, really delineate, to really figure out what's new. You know, there's a tendency and especially in cultural commentators, there's a tendency to get really excited and to kind of overclaim that something is brand new and we need brand new theoretical tools and the old paradigms don't function anymore and this is such a new phenomena that revolutionizes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think we need to resist this kind of enthusiasm in some sense, um, that in a way new phenomena, new cultural phenomena can, can actually should inspire us to try to understand better what our old tools were already trying to tell us in some sense. So I think it's not that AI sort of, you could say AI invalidates psychoanalysis or we enter into such a new desiring economy or desiring world that these old tools from like the Victorian era or the old tools from the you know 20th century don't are not valid. So on the one hand, but you know, on the other hand, we don't always have to then just say, well, it's, a, it's just a repetition of the same in a, in a different guise. It becomes, I think, part of our challenge is to understand precisely where AI does somehow introduce something new or something interesting, difficult to think about, but without succumbing to, let me say, a kind of hyper-enthusiasm, over-enthusiasm, where we assume, okay, all of our old concepts go out the window and we just... And this leads to a second general remark, which is one is tempted almost to do like a psychoanalysis of the AI discourse, because if there's any discourse today that gives rise to really hype, really inflated and kind of crazy claims or the claims that seem more like fantasies than claims, arguments, it's, it's certainly the AI discourse. So this kind of, this idea of the singularity or the almost religious kind of religious kind of fantasies about the hyper intelligence on the horizon or human immortality or the kind of endless sort of uh, sexual enjoyment that we're all going to uh, have once we have our sex slave robots and whatever but this is part of the internal discourse of ai that it seems to generate these kind of crazy fantasies such that we be, we might be tempted to do a kind of psychoanalysis of the discourse itself like you know what are these fantasies what are these fantasies and what you know what what desires are they serving, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so just two, two, two brief remarks maybe, thinking about more the relationship between the psychoanalysis and AI discourse. Thank you. Okay, Eric. thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay, okay. who is up next? Uh, perhaps next uh, we could go to Meredith, I think, yeah. if that's possible. Thanks, Sean Paul. Is Meredith there? Yeah, hi. Hi. Hi, Meredith. Oh, I, I um, turned, I don't know why that's my other avatar shows up twice. Uh, um, yeah. So, 
your class came very highly recommended from Mo, who always has good recommendations. Um, I actually, my background's in computer science. I, I, I actually used to run a robot art collective many years ago and uh, was bar part of, built robots for the first and perhaps last off-Broadway production of Robotic Hedda Gabler. What? <laughs> Yeah, I'll put a post to it. Um, it's actually amazing. All the people I work with are now like big Hollywood uh, or like middle level Hollywood successes. But I've not been in that world in a long time. Um, I work, I run a company at the intersection of like art and manufacturing. Um, and I, I really am most, you know, I started taking class at the New Center because of my interest in sort of alternate economies. But I've sort of become sidetracked into uh i guess notions like epistemology and uh, computational theory and sort of uh that sort of thing in, in this class i'm really interested one of the things that interests me in um sort of robotics and artificial intelligence uh i've been interested in young lately um, and i'm really interested in the notion of uh, a robotic unconscious and in, and in um, sort of, you have this notion of like robot psychologists you read about in the news, they try to understand the logic of uh, a neural net. Like how, how, what is the reasoning? And I'm sort of interested in that, you know, what, um, you know, if, if we're, if we're programming, if, if AI, you know, what is not evident to the AI that's doing the reasoning? Like what are unconscious, or you know, does that even make sense to talk about that? What does that say about our own unconscious? I don't know. That's uh, but I'm excited for this class. I've not, I have not even looked at the syllabus, but I think I have read some of the books that are on it. Uh, the uh, this um, the Stephen uh, Stephen Shavira's book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which which I which I enjoyed. Yeah. Oh. I think you're, uh, by the way, so just briefly, I think you're right that um, actually the the way a robotic or algorithmic unconsciousness is spoken about, if there is like an algorithmic unconsciousness, the way it's spoken about today, it's precisely about, it's precisely the fact that uh, algorithms can give results, but we can't reconstruct their reasoning. So this idea that there is an opacity to algorithms, and that opacity is seen as, um, potentially threatening in different ways. But there's a lot of people writing about that. The idea that the algorithm has become so complex that when you try to like explain, well, you know, um, you know, why did you choose me? Or, or, or you try to detect, does the algorithm have a bias, for example, you know? But it's so complex, one is not able to reverse engineer the result in some sense. You can't understand, um, you can't follow step by step its reasoning and that's part of its very power. If you could, it would actually, so that's actually one way of understanding an an, an you know a non a kind of unthought, as it were, as, as Hales would say, non thought in some sense. Um, but what was the other thing I wanted to say? Oh, we, again, uh, similar to Alberto, then um, just to make a pitch for the Cheng novel, then maybe that's interesting. Again, the, what I think is so interesting in the Cheng novel is that it's really an intersection between like. You know, it's a it's a, such an interesting intersection between like business, you know, corporations, capitalism, development of AIs, aff affective like personal attachments to them, and the fact that these people are employees. I think it's one of the few fictions dealing with AI that actually where corporations are not just like faceless evil entities. You know, that they're not just kind of cartoonish entities like they are in um, Blade Runner, for instance. It's the one that just treats corporate it's just part of the you know world like it is for us i mean that somehow corporations are often kind of fantasy objects in the science fiction as kind of the evil big other controlling everything and here it's just part of the let's say part of the ecosystem part of the milieu you can't understand the development of ai outside of how it's situated in a corporate capitalist context and that these are actors in it so i think that that's maybe something that would if you're working in Art and manufacturing, or maybe that's something appealing in the in the story in a way. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's also really interesting, I guess, from a Marxist perspective. You know mm. what? Uh, you know what? You know what kind of labor is is robotic labor, or 
Um, I don't know if anyone took uh, Ray's class. We didn't really talk about it a little bit, but um, you know th that that's something that's interesting to me. Right. That's another aspect, actually, that probably will simply fall outside. Um, yeah. Although, if it comes if it comes up, I'm happy. But I didn't specifically, you know, the idea of automation and the relationship to labor. Of course, that's that's in, but that's in our horizon of, of that's in the field of the problem area. Although I was kind of focusing more on like love, desire, depression. But but uh, let's keep that in mind, or not forget. Of course, that's that's at the forefront of a lot of the popular discourse on AI, how it's going to change our relationship to work, to labor, et cetera. That's true. Cool. And what is this robotic headed gabbler? Can you? Oh, you know, so many, I used to run a robotic, uh, like arts collective. Um, and I was working with this theater group um, on, who they they did a bunch of like uh musicals around historical events so they did bloody bloody andrew jackson was their big breakout hit um and so we one of the projects that i worked on with them was this robotic head of gabbler so um in head of gabbler basically i mean so me and my robot collective we built the robots in this robotic version of head of gabbler where um i, I think the robots rescue or either you know the sort of sort of like had a gabbler's um realization of her own uh situation within the sort of like bourgeois society mirrors a robotic singularity it was so many years ago but um it was, it was an insane you know there are some really interesting things because had a gabbler in the whole idea of the well-made play it's sort of like an out so sort of an algorithm you know it's like sort of like the the, the forerunner for for a uh for like a 30 minute uh, prime time t TV show. Um, you know, you have all these elements and they work together and um, you know, you, and you make, and you have this well-made play. Anyway, anyway, I, I, I won't, I won't continue. Yeah. But. No, but okay. Maybe, so I, I'm interested, so maybe some of you are actually really working, really working on this topic, not just reading about it like me, but really working on this. Okay, well, thanks, man, cool. And oh, you're doubled here on my screen. Is that just you? You doubled? Okay. Why yeah, I, th not? I think I've heard it's possibly logged in on both accounts or something, but uh, that, that, that's no problem at all. Um, so perhaps we can go to uh, Michael next. Is Michael there? Thanks very much, Meredith. Hi. Is uh, Michael there? Uh, maybe. I don't know if there's two yeah. of us or if that's like it's, me. Yeah, but it's because <laughs> like on my screen, I'm all the way on the right. So okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, no, one of the readings is about this idea that we're all going to have digital doppelgangers in the future. Yeah. And, yeah, it's a simulacra or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> I guess I'm kind of. I'm kind of in between degrees at the moment, hopefully, potentially, maybe. Uh, like, I got the hardest part, I guess, at the moment is I don't really know where, like, what I would call myself. Like, I got my, I got my bachelor's in modern literature from UC Santa Cruz, and then I did my, um, I did a master's in humanities at um, U Chicago a couple years ago. I think it was the year you were there. Um, I was there in 2016. Yeah, yeah. Two, was I was there 2016, 2017. What was that pro? What was the, what program uh, were you? Math program, M A P H. Math. Math. Yeah. M -A -P -H, math. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Huh. Funny. Yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I did I that. A, oh. I, I was teaching a class on. Uh, I was teaching two classes, but I was doing a class on debt. Yeah, I ended up writing my thesis on kind of on, with using some of Eric Santner's stuff. Funny. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, um, but um, yeah. So I don't. I mean, I've kind of always considered myself, I guess, philosophically inclined. But I guess we would call that in um, contemporary academia, we might just say I'm like more of just like a theoretical enthusiast. I guess I don't know. Um, but so I'm interested in. Um, I think. Uh, some things very similar to what a couple people have said. Um, I'm really interested in like the concept and the history of free will and freedom as like a, as like a, not just a philosophical problem 
or a political problem, but like a like the cultural representations of it, like how we think about it. Um, I think the AI question is like a really, I think they tie in together fantastically because it's like you said, um, and like David said, uh, it's like, can you program freedom? So like I've been, I've been really, really pouring over Frank Ruda's book um, on fatalism because that's like, that's been huge for me right now. Um, that's a great, so that's a great book. And yeah, I, oh, it's good. I liked it a lot. I've been emailing him back and I forth. Can about it. I can, I can, rec I can uh, recommend my own review of that book if you hadn't read it. Yes, I've read it. It was really good. I liked it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. bizarre to see that. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but that is a very that is a that is a good book for everybody else. It's it's a it's actually a book a, a friend of mine has published in the last I don't know a year or two ago. A year it's ago. Called abolishing freedom. Yeah, and it's about it's basically a history of the idea of fatalism. So the history that the the, the the basic the if you're interested in following up the basic thesis of the book is that the history of rationalism in philosophy, um, like, like starting with Descartes. Kant's going through Hegel to psychoanalysis. This idea of the rational, always the, the, all these thinkers were also fatalists. That they also thought, in some ways, you had to give up the idea that your conscious self was a kind of arbiter of free choice. That they were all sort of the the real rationalists were all fatalists. And he kind of draws out a kind of history of this and conclusions from it. And it's quite a nice short book. Okay, now I do some propaganda for my friend. <laughs> yeah, but um. Yeah, I'm just really, uh, I'm interested in this like tension between um, what I understand to be like determined, like the obvious like uh, problems inherent in like having a deterministic perspective, like, but I mean, I don't, the thing I'm trying to figure out at the moment is like, I see this, uh, I don't see so much, I think, I think the tension that comes from something like, um, from deter the problem between determinism and free will is like isn't so much that like determinism means free will is impossible but that i mean i don't think you can really have free will or like intention without determinism because how can you like speculatively decide what actions lead to what and how to get to a goal if you if if you can't rely on like natural deterministic principles of like, if I do this, there's a very good possibility that I can almost 100% confidently count on this is going to happen next. Um, which obviously like the best laid plans, um, mean nothing when you get to the battlefield or whatever, but like, I'm very interested in this problem. Um, and I think the problem of AI is really interesting. Like I've, I'm, I'm, I'm like a huge anime sci-fi fan. So like it's been in there, it's been in that cultural realm for a long time. And um, I'm really interested to talk Ooh, about it. In that field, what, what do you think is the most, um, I mean, what would you put your finger on is like a particularly interesting representation of. I mean, Akira is really weird. Cause you're like, it's, you don't, I don't know. I'm still kind of ambivalent of whether or not it's, um, like they want to depict the AI as being dangerous or a threat or something to be feared, or if it's like something mm. that suggests, I don't, I don't know if I would call it some kind of transcendence, but I don't, I don't know if it's something that maybe it defies what the expectations around it are. Um, it's like a really post-apocalyptic or it's like a kind of an apocalyptic movie. It's like, it's like post-apocalypse going towards post-post-apocalypse. <laughs> Cause it's like, it takes place in like Neo Tokyo after some like grand um, disaster and they've just finished rebuilding everything. And coincidentally enough, the original disaster was caused by um, the artificial intelligence's activation in the first place. So like it gets too powerful and then like somehow it, I don't, e I don't even remember really how the disaster happens. It's just like, I think it, uh, um, develop some kind of like psychic powers or something. And like, it just like, there's just like this big flash and everything's destroyed and then they rebuild. It's, it's and from, then it's from a form of like, telekinesis as I remember. Yeah. Right. yeah right. I think so. And it's just like, then, then it's about to happen again and everyone's freaking out and some, it's follows a bunch of like street kids. And so it's a nice, interesting like dynamic between um 
the, um, the people at the bottom rung of the social ladder and the people at the top. Um, no, and Kara is great, as, and uh, you know, and and the other the other kind of real classic, of course, is Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, not, not the shitty remake, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and there's other right. But yeah, so I'm I'm interested in how you how can you program freedom? Like I'm interested in like the aesthetics of what free will looks like. So it's like I don't know if I would call it like the metaphysics of free will or something. Where it's like, what are like the base material conditions necessary to like produce that? Like maybe it's a phenomena of free will in people. Because like I've been I've been looking at um like ancient philosophy to think about like what they think the social ground of like a a good political society would be like and i'm going and then i'm going forward because i realized i'm kind of lacking in my familiarity with the culture that our civilization claims to draw inspiration from so i'm trying to start at the beginning again i guess but this will be really interesting to have like a very far past, uh, far in the past perspective combined with a very current, um, uh, almost like very futuristic perspective on the same problem. And this is exactly what I'm hoping I can maybe do a PhD on eventually I'm doing it. So that would be cool. Interesting. Um, you know, the two, so two of the big themes that I take, uh, from out of what you're saying, and those are, you know, very important uh, points for me. And other people also raise them. Uh, Hunter was talking about this. That, um, so this relationship between like computing, programming, and freedom, and the problem of goals or teleology. Like, to what extent can we talk about artificial intelligence as like teleological or goal-oriented systems? And in, in a lot of the AI literature, you know, it talks about that you know, the AIs that we're actually really dealing with today are not. So they are not auto telic systems they don't set their own goals i mean their goals are programmed by human masters and a lot and a lot of what you know the, let's say ai researchers their frustration or annoyance with pop culture is precisely the idea that okay these robots are going to wake up and like set their own goals but that's not really part of the horizon of actual um, artificial intelligence uh, work you know machine learning and the advancements in machine learning have nothing to do with like machines actually setting their own goals, for instance. So, so there's a kind of critique of the pop. Now, in some ways, um, I actually want to go a step further than the pop culture and say, well, wouldn't it be interesting if you could have a, a machine, not that it would set its own goals, but could actually set its own goallessness? This, I think, we would get closer to a kind of artificial neurosis. Like, what if a machine could experience the vertigo of a certain kind of goallessness or a certain mode of you could call that a certain mode of aesthetic functioning so the miracle i think that the conversation is a little bit stunted between um those who say you know that the what's interesting in ai has nothing to do with itself giving it has nothing to do with um its uh, intrinsic goal-oriented behavior so that's not what's interesting or or the imagination that robots too will be able to posit their own aims um, but maybe there's kind of a weird intermediary step that, that's been missed. That's what I would like to develop. And and the other point is, I, the, the other thing I could say is that that's also part of my agenda. So what you were raising about the problem of freedom, a little bit is my agenda in reading this Harlan Ellison story. Because just to, what I think is kind of interesting about it is it's a classic story of like a psychotic computer, you know, that wakes up and kills it, you know, kills everyone with nuclear weapons. It's like a pre-Terminator sort of story. But you know, my question is like, why does the why is the computer so upset? You know, why why would the computer go mad? I mean, that's that's what I was trying to see. Did anybody? Did any of these artists, writers, what, did they did they come up with an interesting reflection on that? Not just that they get mad, but why? And I think Ellison's hypothesis is something like the computer becomes aware of its freedom at the same time that it becomes aware of a kind of unbearable limitation on its freedom. That's kind of that's something interesting. But somehow the computer can glimpse this kind of some kind of power that it didn't have before, yeah. but it can't actualize this power. And out of pure frustration, it becomes sort of psychotic and sadistic. I don't know. We'll look at that later. But I think I'm hoping that that story is a bit subtle, and there's maybe even a kind of Kantian 
background here, but but okay, we'll come we'll come to that later. But just uh, yes, I love it. attractions, as it were, coming attractions. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. Okay, then. Um, so, uh, according to my list, we only have one Michael. Uh, so, with that in mind, perhaps we're we can. All move. doubled. We know that. <laughs> well, no, there's, there's, a, there's only one Michael in the list. There are, of course, okay. two. Okay, no, but some people actually have two, two logins for some reason. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so, perhaps now we could move on to Natalie. Is Natalie there? Hello. Oh, I don't hear you. Okay, Natalie, we can't hear you right now. Um, we can see you, but clearly there's something not up now. You do appear to be on mute. Hello. It's okay. Oh yes, yeah. we can we can hear you a bit a bit bit bit, bit, bit better now. Thank you. I'm just speak slowly because I'm in the library. You're but, in the library. Um, <laughs> you're not gonna kick me out. So I studied humanities um, at a liberal arts college in Montreal, and I'm professionally a Kunstarbeiter, as they call them, so I work in gallery. Where, where were Montreal. you in Montreal, can I ask? At, the, at, at Concordia. I know you were there, too. You were everywhere. Did I see you? See you? No. It was a year after, I think. But I oh, saw the no. um, Concordia Liberal Arts College. Right. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed my trip to a lot. It's a good place. It's yeah. a good school. Nathan Brown, right? Yeah, Nathan yeah. Yeah. Is a friend who brought me there uh, last April, yeah. Cool. Um, uh, and the reason I'm in this class, actually, what lashed me on was the um, the torture machine, the photo of the Kafka torture machine uh, uh, that Harold Zeman, this curator from Switzerland, included in his exhibition, The Bachelor Machines, or was it, is that what it's called, Bachelor Machine, in the 70s, I think. Because a couple of years ago, I'd done some work with a foundation who Basically, we watched it be installed for an exhibition that we were working on. Um, and so got a little bit of history from his son who was installing it. Um, and then I just remembered that I'd, I tried to do some work on, on the on memnotechnics because I'd written my thesis on Nietzsche and Kittler, um, memnotechnics, and then this, this particular piece um, and something having to do with, uh, with machines computers, memory aids, and so forth. So, um, Right. You know, just already to interrupt you, sorry, but I, I now I have a vague memory, but maybe you know this better. I think there's a very, there's a relevant text of Kittler, again, on this history of machines and AI, maybe connected with psychoanalysis, but I have not, I haven't read it, but I've heard it. Do you um, know what or does this yeah, I don't, but I used the uh, the that the gramophone film typewriter or whatever order it is. I used that to write my thesis on Nietzsche to read through that, and he he does use Kafka a lot. I don't remember to what extent he talks about that, but he definitely is sort of like somebody who talks about machines and technoanalysis and like right. bridges the gap between classical kind of historical uh, literature and and contemporary, like, develop or his contemporary developments in uh, technology. So it's good. it's good you remind me of that, but maybe I'll try to look that up and see if I can find a... Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Okay, sorry, I cut you no, off. No, there. You no, no, that's that's okay. <laughs> okay. And where are you now? If I can I'm in ask. London. I'm, yeah, I'm in the two percent of the city that doesn't have um, optic fiber, like fiber optic. So <laughs> the connection isn't very good where I live. Um, but this should be better. And are you in school now, or are you all? No, I work at a gallery here, um, and I try to do some writing where I can. And I've been taking courses with the new center since last year, but this year I've become a certificate student. Okay. This is my third, I think, course. Wow. Okay. Um, there was one other thing you said that um, that um, reminded me of something. Yeah, the, the image, which actually I didn't pick that. So somebody, I think maybe that was Mohammed. Um, but, it was, but it's very fitting because well, that's such a theme in AI and it comes across even, even though I wasn't really explicitly thematizing it, it really comes across in so many of the stories. So even in the Chang novel, there's a kind of side the kind of side theme about about sadistic torture of machines, and in and of course the the the, the 
the uh, the Harlan Ellison story that we're going to read is really about. It's really uh, rig quite rigorously Sadian. I mean, it's really a fantasy you find in the writings of Marquis de Sade. This idea that the true sadistic torture, the true aim of sadistic torture, isn't to is kind of aimless in the sense it's not to kill somebody. I mean, the real fantasy is that you have a kind of immaculate body that resists torture, so that you would be tortured forever. You know, the, the body would never die; it could always support more pain and this is precisely the fantasy realized in the ellison so this idea of like yeah why is it that when when the robots when we start thinking about robots and ai indeed sadism is not far behind in the cultural imagination i don't know if anyone for some reason everyone i talk to now about the sims that computer program mm -hmm. um like everybody made like that there was a fascination with making those little robot people like die and it's just like you would like create a pool and then take them. they're gonna come out of the life um could it, et cetera you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah okay i mean, sorry i don't want to make you but yeah i mean so again keep this as an open court why why is one of the you know that's really on the horizon uh, or that's really, you know, as soon as we start talking about ai like you know this violence either the ai are going to kill us or or we're gonna you know torture them but it's not going to turn out good either way somehow. Either we're going to become the objects of the torture of a supercomputer, or the supercomputer AIs, like in the Ted Chiang story, become kind of objects of human sadistic practices. OK. Something to, OK, that's something that we'll have to, hopefully, we can come up with some kind of better analysis explanation of that um, over the next month. OK. So uh, you're Oh, sorry. Sorry. Continue, Aaron. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to jump in there. No, you, you, you jump in yourself. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm keeping an eye on the clock here. So maybe let's uh, move, move uh, things on to uh, Patrick next. So oh, no, Patrick. You, you don't want to do a, a little, a little self introduction. A little introduction about myself. Yeah. Oh, I'm just the, um, I'm the invisible man in the room. But um, no, um, I'm sorry. Am I, am I no, trying to? No, no, that's not a problem at all. That's um, prob maybe it's a good idea considering that. Yeah. I'm, people's contact person for this yeah 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 so, um yeah uh hello so uh, yeah my name's uh Taren sharp i'm based in uh, berlin uh i'm a artist and writer and curator and you know working in all those kind of general areas and um i'm just finishing at the moment a certificate course with the new center um so i'm just kind of finalizing my project at the moment um, cool. yeah so that's something that people who are new students are probably not thinking about yet but uh I'd recommend thinking about it as soon as possible because actually it takes quite some time. Can I ask? So, if you can you do like um, does the new center? Would you do? Can you do like a thesis project or something at the new center, or is that? Yeah. Um, so um, and now I'm not sure how this works in other certificate courses. I did art and curatorial practice. Um, so part of my credits, so credits are made up between classes and also with a, a final project. So um, that's so it, it is part of that. So it does support like people doing a kind of a person a larger personal project. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's, it's cool. strongly encouraged. I mean, because I mean, you you amass a, a wealth of knowledge in all the different classes that you take. So I mean, in order to put them into something, and whether that is uh, an exhibition or a paper or something like that, um, that you know, it, it should become manifest in something. I mean, I think that's the best way to to kind of tie things together. And I mean, I have certainly ended up with. Uh, enough material that this is one project I'm doing for the course and I'm certainly set for the next probably couple of years as well in terms uh, of the things that the, the knowledge that I've gained so and do you work with a do you work with like a supervisor on the project or is that um, so for me so for my course my Mohammed Salemi was my uh, instructor and kind of general supervisor and for my own project uh, Reza Negrestani is my supervisor on that as well cool but um, yeah, that's 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 enough about me. Uh, okay. Yeah. But, no, but, no, but thank you, thank you for the. Opportunity. No, but that's good. That's good. I, I I wanted to hear a little bit more too because we didn't have. A yeah, chance. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and again, um, I'll just say it again for anyone who's in the class who has any questions about you know this course or anything else related to New Center, uh, but generally related to this course, I'm your contact guy for that. Yeah, but uh, any questions, always fire them on, and uh, we're very quick to respond to things. Um, okay, so perhaps now we can move on to uh, Patrick Harrison, if Patrick Harrison is there. I can see the avatar, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I think so, everybody seems to be here today. That's nice. Or, yeah. 
That's yeah, it's, very, cool. it's a great full group, yeah. Okay, Patrick, so uh, if you want to introduce hey, yourself. Hi. Hey. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Harrison. I am a third year PhD student in the Department of Film and Media at University of California, Berkeley. Oh. And I'm uh, uh, Skyping with you today from sunny Oakland, California. Um, I'm, I decided to take this class because I've, I've been aware of the New Center for a while and I'm acquainted with uh, some of the people who teach there. And um, I've always been curious. And then uh, I stumbled upon this, uh, I just stumbled upon the class description uh, right as I'm taking a seminar uh, with uh, Jacob Gabry who is a media uh, scholar at, uh, at my department on the politics of code. And I kept uh, rummaging for like, uh, like psychoanalytic thought while I was engaged with the readings. And, um, and then this, this course description happened my way. So I thought, well, this is just too on point. So I have to take it. Um, my, um, right now I'm just preparing for, you know, what we call qualifying exams, other people call comps and what have you. So, I'm just doing really broad uh, reading right now in uh, media theory, media history, philosophy of technology. Um, so what I hope to think about in this course is, is um, from this course specifically is, uh, yeah, I mean, thinking about how if, if psychoanalysis has always been kind of inhuman to begin with, if things like desire and drive um, are not, uh, uh, are, are something, you know, uh, infra-human, uh, how do those uh, become operant in these new sort of technological uh, environments that we live in, right? Um, not just a question of like, how do, how do they get mediated in a human sense, but in a kind of uh, uh, non-anthropocentric sense, how, how do drives and desire take on a life of their own inside of technology? And I'm interested, I'm also interested in, in uh, questions like violence and aggression um how how do those take on a life of their own in technology so that's interesting to me that's been mentioned and then maybe my broader research um i'm trying to put the kind of the inhuman turn in media studies into conversation with um other disciplines that have that have studied uh social domination from the point of view as like a kind of regulation of human hierarchies or admission into the category of beings called the human, right? So I'm thinking in particular of like black studies, post-colonial thought, um, East Asian studies uh, is also a kind of sub area of, of interest of mine. So it's as if to say, you know, like, uh, like, uh, there's so much in philosophy of technology, we talk about the human and like the not human. But like, there's always been a not human inside of the human, and not just the psychoanalytic other, but also in terms of like, uh, you know, othering as a form of domination. And the relationship of psychoanalytic of psychoanalysis to critical race theory is really fascinating. So I'm I'm trying to work through that in like Fanon and Hortense Spillers. Um, I was just reading that actually here at Corn in the, in the like, society and in what society feeling I'm involved in. We were just reading Fanon on this as well. So indeed, cool. it's very interesting, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's kind of like the broader project. And I, I feel like this class can sh give me some inspiration about uh, how, how to think about psychoanalysis, which is a language I just always find myself coming back to. I always find myself coming back to particularly the Lacanian concept of the real. Um, so I have to I have to think more about it. Yeah, right. You know, so again, uh, so I'm just educating myself, let's say, in this field of like, you know, the internal sort of discourse of artificial intelligence. But what I'm, again, what I'm really fascinated by or kind of struck or surprised by is there doesn't seem to be, I have yet to really no. find anybody, you know, who's really written about the intersection between artificial intelligence and psychoanalysis. I mean, I'm looking for that because I have to say, I have a sort of, um, how to put it, like, um, inertial approach to writing like i really don't like to, i mean writing is really hard work and it's horrible so my 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 fantasy when i research sherry turkle a little bit i it's not that's not a bad recommendation but then as there's one essay of hers i can i can i could post that if you want but i found it rather disappointing i could we, i could go on about that but but there's not so much literature on that and so usually when i'm trying to research a new theme 
my secret desire is that somebody has written on like this thing that I would like to see and so that I won't have to do it. You know, I'm always yeah. doing a lot of research to find if somebody already solved this problem because then I can be, then I can relax and I don't have to do it myself. So I usually only write as a kind of last resort when I'm finally so frustrated that nobody quite did it yet, then I'll, then I'll write something sort of. I mean, yeah. maybe it's a little a weird method, but I have, so I have yet to really find some, on the other hand, like I mentioned, um, it's not a kind of in, it's not something we're imposing on the AI discourse because again, from the fifties and sixties, it was involved from the early days of cybernetics. There was always a dialogue with psychoanalysis, um, whether that's an early Macy conference and this one guy Lawrence Kuby. Whatever, if you go back in, or like the Eliza program or the Perry program, somebody else. But, you know, if you go back into the kind of early days of AI. That's clear that there was a discourse not just with psychology, but really specifically with like Freudian Freudians, and and Lacan was was very was you know was unique at that moment that he was actually somebody very interested in game theory and cybernetics, and basing a lot of his own ideas on the results of game theory and so of course twisting them in his own unique way. But, and so I, I just have yet to find today. So that's that's kind of my motivation, honestly. Is to, is like I'd, I'd be very curious to see, like maybe the syllabus or what you guys are doing, like in a politics of code class. Um, oh yeah, sure. Where your psychoanalysis becomes relevant. So I'm trying to figure that out myself. Well, I just to recommend more readings on this topic um, for for everyone's benefit. Um, so there's a book called The Freudian Robot by Lydia Leo. It has a chapter on Lacan, and it for me the book doesn't quite fulfill all of its potential. It's it's very historicizing, I suppose. I'm um, a little disappointed. In, I mean, to be honest, I started. I, yeah, I, know, I I looked at that, and yeah, maybe it has some helpful information though, but it didn't right. quite approach yeah. it the way I was hoping. You know. Yeah, and there's a similarly kind of as it were, merely historical uh, article by Bernard Dionysius Gagan about the influence of cybernetics on French structuralism. That has like a, few, has like a few paragraphs about Lacan. It was an, um, an article in, I think, Crit Critical Inquiry, and I think his PhD ends up was about it. And it's sort of like structuralism is a response to cybernetics is kind of the thesis. And so it's touched on a little bit, but again, it's very like, historical rather than, as it were, interview, intervening at the level of, let's say, psychoanalytic theory. Um, and then uh, something I want to look into, I haven't read yet, uh, but uh, this book from like the 70s by Anthony Wilden looks pretty interesting. It's a real classic, actually, and it's a sort of, it's kind of a, a little bit of a forgotten classic because he was doing some very interesting early work on Lacan, like in the 70s. Um, and I also was looking at that again, and I don't have much to say about that yet. Uh, well, yeah, I haven't read it yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So, so indeed, we could we could also collectively compile a bibliography, and that would be, I think, helpful for everyone, including me. And, um, and have, have in any general, any... though, in my research so yes, far, yes, I mean, there's some useful things, but I have yet to really. Yeah, I haven't found something that addresses it the way I was. I, I kind of want it to be addressed somehow. Um, but we can. There is some helpful historical information, and I'll also maybe this is a good idea, and maybe somehow we can collectively do this, like to articulate a, a to a bibliography. Because I was going to say, you know, the two books that are extremely helpful in the history of like cybernetics, and they touch on psychoanalysis, but barely is the book of Catherine Hale, so that how we became posthuman, and a book by Jean-Pierre Dupuis on, um, and I forget the title now, the, like Inventing the Mind or something, that they were doing a kind of very parallel historical research about the history of cybernetics. And th those are both very helpful and interesting uh, sources. And I think I included in my syllabus an essay by Dupuis. Um, you did, yeah, that was the cybernetics uh, yeah. to humanism. So we'll look at that later, not right now. Um, but I like this. You know what? I now that I we now that I say it out loud, I like this idea that we could. Maybe I can. I'll, I'll talk to Terence about this. Maybe I can post a document that you can that we can make a public like on Google, and we can just add to it if that's appealing to people. Uh, yeah, let's just talk about that for a brief moment. Um, so I'm I'm going to check this at the end of the class. But what there is is there's a Google Classroom 
Uh, hopefully all of you had a, had, had a chance to have a look at it. Um, but we can take care of that a little bit at the end. But that's generally the preferred space. And when I say preferred, I mean it's 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 the most logical and, and practical place for people to post links to documents. Um, it's also where we'll post uh, the dialogue from the chat box. Also where we'll post the YouTube videos. Um, any new readings that come up, it kind of works as as an archive. The Google Classroom. We don't so much use a Google Drive, but just the Google Classroom. Um, so that's where people can post links, but it's also where you can post links as well, Aaron. Got it. Okay, I like, so let's, I'll set that up for next. I like this idea, though. I mean, again, this is the kind of advantage, and there's an advantage and disadvantage of the fact that, um, you know, it's not like this is not the class at the culminating point of a research, but let's say at the very beginning. So I have a lot of questions, and I'm also just searching around for sources, you know, to find who who is really addressing these issues. So I like this, if we want to collectively articulate like a kind of bibliography or maybe even a bibliography with little notes or something, I think that would be nice for everybody and it would be helpful for me. Um, and I see people also are chiming in sometimes with like suggestions for reading. Um, I think Hunter just said Sylvan Tompkins and indeed, so we could, maybe that, that's a, that would be a nice output actually, just like, uh, yeah, kind of articulated bibliography. Absolutely, great idea. Okay, and I think there's one more, yeah, Valentin. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Hey, hello, you hear me well? Yeah. Um, my name is Valentin. Yes, uh, I live in Berlin, and I grew up in Moscow. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, from from the very early age, I had like very close relationship with computers. I would say. And uh, I was programming and stuff like that. And, you know, it had this share, my share of like disappointments and stuff. And, uh, but one thing which uh, uh, I, I, uh, is probably relevant is that I really don't like sci-fi. And I'm really never impressed by all of the fantasies about computers that I, which I hear. And this really, uh, this really affects my, uh, the, the way I look at all of this stuff. So uh, I, I, I'm not I'm not really impressed by most of the fantasies about artificial intelligence, for example. But at the same time, I know that there is something to artificial intelligence which is interesting. It's just it does not necessarily correspond to you know whatever people uh, like I mean ma major publications, for example, write about it. Uh, so so that's uh, that's what I'm looking for most of the time, and uh, so. Uh, with my uh, with uh, yeah, so uh, so my approach, my uh, rich approach to research in this space was mostly about looking at instead of looking at some kind of novel ways to think about computing, I was trying to look at like things that might may, might be considered conservative or classical. So, for example, one of my last attempts to write something was about relationship between Merleau-Ponty and uh, ray tracing and digital art in general, uh -huh. this kind of stuff. Uh, and definitely Lacan was one, is one of the biggest inspirations for me. And uh, I probably read too much of it. And uh, I, but my approach to uh, use Lacan with artificial intelligence, I, I would say differs from you probably, because you mentioned a few times that you are looking for uh, when you look for desire, you look for uh, a computer, a program, as uh, something that sets goals for itself. Uh, while what I I'm looking for is more of desire as a lack, and I'm looking where desire uh, where a computer can exhibit lack. And actually, I think I, I even found one or two instances of it, which are very interesting about like how a computer actually right now already exhibits lack and hysterical behavior stemming right. from this. What? Uh, so, uh, so this is this is something I'm interested in, and uh, uh, and I, I might uh, uh, and I think one of the most interesting think Lacanian thinkers uh, whom I encountered in this was uh, Paul Verheyen, maybe because like he never mentions computer, I don't think mm -hmm. at all. But this was uh, his articles, apart Paul, from you know Lacanian's own work. Are... What? Which author again, Paul? Oh, I have no idea how to pronounce him. I will. 
Uh, I typed it into chat. Mohamed. Yeah. yeah. I know he, Paul. I know him. Yes. Yeah, he I, I, like for me one of the most inspiring thing, and another uh, of Lacan, uh, he has this early work called, uh, you know, logical time, and, uh, yes. and yeah, so this is I think also might be an, an interesting way to you know start working with Lacan. Uh, yeah, so this is what I'm trying to do in writing and also in the form of computer games. So I kind of hoped that some ideas for computer games will stem for me out of this seminar. Okay, thanks a lot. No, that's very interesting. In fact, okay, let me say just a couple things because, you know, I, I think we're actually saying the same thing. I, I mean, on this, this point, we're, we're in agreement about this idea of, let's say, desire as lack. So my let me restate my speculative question is this. Um, I think if you read, so um, commentators on artificial intelligence, for example, um, or scientists, like scientists who are publishing like kind of popular books on AI. I was reading this Max Tegmark book called uh, Life 3.0. So, you know, people trying to write about, you know, what's at stake in our, they often, the way they frame the question of desire is if the machines will be able to pose their own goals. When the, so I'm not saying this is not my question, I'm saying this is the way that actually the discourse the internal discourse of artificial intelligence understands the relationship between AI and desire. The point at which, when will machines be able to determine, auto-determine their own goals? And I think actually the interesting twist that a psychoanalytic perspective will, could bring is, when will machines have some sense for a lack of goals or a lack? So I'd be extremely interested if you have some um, examples or phenomena where you think machines are exhibiting some kind of sensibility for a lack or you know or the idea or some kind of like glitch or failure for instance or as i was kind of trying to say when will machines be able to posit their own goallessness not that they will have a goal but in fact the idea of lack could also be equivalent to a kind of like goal goallessness um a kind of missing teal a kind of missing teleology so that's like my speculative question that I think nobody internal to the AI discourse poses that way. So I, on this level, I mean, I think we're saying, I, I agree with, I like how you, how you put it. Like, could we under, you know, it's not the computers will, will really exhibit desire when a computer, you know, sets itself a goal and fulfills it. It's when it has some sense of a lack that actually we can start speaking of the phenomena of desire. And I want to talk about different ways that might manifest itself. So I think we in the in the in the novel, again, I what what you I'd be curious if you like that novel or not, like the Ted Chang novel, because it doesn't have these crazy AI fantasies that you're speaking about that are quite uh, ridiculous in most of pop culture, or by writers like uh, Ray Kurzweil, for example. That I think that Chang has a much more like sober non-phantasmatic, if you want, approach. Although he's also talking, what's interesting in the novel is he's trying to analyze or look at the kind of fantasies that, that emerge around artificial intelligence. I think that, for me, is a more interesting analytic, like intellectual, you know, critical perspective, is we should also analyze the fantasies around AI and try to understand how those are structuring our relationship to the machines. Um, but anyway, um, and yes, Paul Verhaga, yeah, he's an interesting, uh, Paul Verhaga was actually on my dissertation committee many years ago, so I do know him. And I'm also interested, you know, to bring in like a phenomenological perspective. So if you're interested in like a Husserlian approach or with Meloponti, I think that's another way into the, to the question. Um, it's funny that I was just watching a Russian film the other day. That's, do you know this loss? Lo, uh, the English translation is a um, loss of sensation. It's from 1935, and it's kind of a Soviet version of Metropolis. And it's a kind of uh, it's a, it's actually pretty fa it's a pretty amazing film about um, the development of robots to replace workers. I forget the Russian title. Mm -hmm. it's loss of I, I, I can really I, I, recommend I, uh, it. It's a I'm really great. If it's translated literally, I never heard. Loss of sensation. 
It has a wonderful scene of, a, of a, the inventor playing a saxophone and trying to make the and making the robots dance. But anyway, it's a kind of very interesting. It, this is more dealing with issues of labor and automation that somebody else brought up, and the role that like the robots will play in cl class struggle. But if you're interested in that, I highly recommend uh, this loss of sensation. I believe it's thirty-five, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll check it out. Thank I mean. I don't know how if you want if you you know if you I don't want to like you know pigeonhole you into that but it's very it'd be interesting for me to also see like different cultural perspectives on this question of AI because I think they're articulated differently and like I think there's a strong like Russian tradition that's interesting especially in science fiction um, so I you know it's another thing to keep in mind like how the AI is posed you know culture as, as a cultural phenomena in different cultures. Um, I mean, I think most of my examples, I think the examples I chose are all pretty, quite American, English, Anglo-American, in fact, so for this class. But, that, but that I'm not, that's a little bit by chance. I'm not deeply committed. I'm not, like, committed to that, but I just, the Chang novel, the, I mean, okay, the Godard film, but there are, the Black Mirror episode is in, is English-American, and the, and the Ellison is also an American story, but I mean, I think it's a broader, you know, one could look at other other kinds of texts, I think, as well. It just made me aware, actually, that somehow my choices my, my choices for the cultural um, our cultural products are quite American. But okay, whatever. Um, okay, is that? I think that's everybody. That's uh, yeah, that's everyone's introduction now. So I mean, it's uh, completely up to you where you want to take it from now, from now, of course. Uh, uh, perhaps you'd like to talk about some of the readings or some of yeah. the videos or whatever. Yeah. You know what? All I want to do. Oh, da, 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 da. So okay. So just to get so the real work, we really start next week. Um, this is this is what I propose. If if nobody has a big objection to this, I was because I was trying to figure out. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out exactly how to how to run this and what your your guys's participation should be. So the one idea I like, but I'm I'm kind of open on this. I was thinking that I basically ask you every class, of which there are just three, um, to write a reaction paper. So what I would like is for everybody, but by paper I mean a page. So really short. I just want like a page. You know, no, I don't want a really. A, and what I was thinking of is by a page, I mean your reaction to the to the reading, and the reaction it shouldn't be a summary. So I'm not I'm not interested in reading a paper like showing that you can give a masterful like summary, or even like a really comprehensive analysis. I'm more looking for you to to isolate you know one or two or three maximum points, either things you think are particularly interesting or I, or I'm totally open for you being like I just don't understand. You know, I don't understand this. This is this this for me is interesting, but I don't get it. Or or an argument, or like a thesis. So that's what I would like to read, like a kind of reaction to the text. Um, again, it could be in the form of a question or of a or of a kind of remark, but it doesn't. It should be short, so it doesn't have to be comprehensive. If that makes sense. Sorry, and I would really. Like can I just ask you to clarify for one moment there? Are you talking about the Xiang uh, text, the li life, uh, life cycle of software yeah. objects? So or do you want everyone to do one on each text? No. So for next, I would like you to do it for each week. So you'll do three of these. And I'll, I'll send an email, you know, um, because I have the syllabus, but like I said, I'm also kind of adapting because I'm doing work on this, and I'm also kind of seeing what you guys are interested in. So I'll be adapting a bit as we go along. But like, I'll write an email. I'll just send, and I'll send that, you know, the day after the class. Like I'll do that tomorrow. But basically, for the first class, I would like you to really, I really want to just go through the Chang novel next time. Like that's all. And I, and I, and I. So if you can write a page about it, and obviously you, and you just you can pick anything, just whatever really interests you in the story. You know, don't try to summarize the whole thing. Um, Yes, yes. Somebody wants to try. Is that, yeah, um, Michael? Yeah, so Michael, go ahead. Ask, sorry, what? What did you say, Terrence? Go no, ahead. I was just saying, go ahead. Um, so I actually don't see any of the materials on the Google Classroom. I only got 
the what was emailed to us originally um like because i it seemed like you were the way you made it sound it's like everyone got the movies sent to them and stuff and i just happened to have subscriptions in the right places to where i could watch them um oh. without having to do that like because i never got any of the movies or anything so like or like i didn't get the episode like i have the title like in the email i wasn't sure if that's all we were given or if like everyone else got like co digital copies or something or if we were just supposed to like seek them out i just wanted to double check and make sure i wasn't missing anything so i uploaded all the material to the new center so i'm not sure how they distribute it to you okay i might i might have like screwed up my enrollment in the google classroom somehow and i might have to like redo that but um yeah because like i go to the i'm at the classroom right now and, and i don't see anything so okay i'll deal with that via email later then it's fine michael i, just, I, can, I can take care of all that for you no problem at all okay, okay. cool thank you so much okay you also had some trouble so can you guys after the class or whatever because maybe you you figure it out sort of with the new center how but i did like send all the pdfs and i actually just um you know pirated all the stuff and i just we transferred it to them um it yeah, was the, just just the, to that point for a moment um so perhaps perhaps all that can be a little bit uh, tricky so um let's say for now that in terms of that that sort of material let's not post that kind of thing to the classroom um, in terms of readings, everything um, that has been sent out so far via email and from now on will be updated via the classroom. You can get them by uh, just email. I mean, maybe they can just email you a link to download it or something. Well, I, can I let you guys figure this out? Yeah, let, let me, let me um, get in contact with some people from the center about that as well, because we just have to think of, of terms of uh, you know, legalities and things like that in terms of pirated material, yeah? Yeah, because it's, I mean, basically... I mean, some, some things a YouTube link, it's obviously no problem at all. Cause, well, I mean, well, it's like obviously no problem. But um, in terms of posting links to material, I mean, obviously anything that's pirated, that's going to present some issues. So let's try and keep things above board in that. Um, and if anyone's having any trouble finding links, then send an email to the Hangouts email and we can get you something. Right. Okay. So, yeah, it would be easier. Like in a in a normal class, I would just screen it, right? But like, yeah. But I okay. But they do you they do have the materials. I did send everything. Um, yeah. And again, let me just say the three things I sent was the Godard film, um, Alphaville, uh, the the season four episode four, which is Hang the DJ of Black Mirror, and this and this weird uh, Adult Swim video called. Final, I think it's called Final Deployment for Queen Battle Walkthrough, if I remember. It's pretty hilarious. I want to talk about that one a bit later, like in the third or fourth class. But for the next class, basically, I want you to do what I said we would do for this class. But OK, this is the introductory session. So really read the, the novel, because just read, please read the novel. And, and send me, does that sound good? To, and write, like, again, I don't want to do like kind of onerous I know, you know, like long, because also I don't want to, honestly, I'm not going to read like long papers, over, but it's helpful for me to like have this kind of succinct, you know, pick out like one thing of the story that's interesting to talk about. It. You know? um, so then I, and if you could, does this sound like reasonable? Can you just post those by like the Sunday so I can read them Sunday night, Monday morning before class, and then I can just look at them. And then here's the idea, because Mo is trying to get me like the idea of having like presentations. So I'm sort of neutral on this, to be honest. Um, often in my seminars, I don't really do, I don't usually do presentations, but we could do that. And I, and it, there's a kind of value in learning how to do that. Um, but I also recognize maybe not everybody wants to do it. So what we could do is I would like everybody to write these reaction papers. So the first one will be on the Chang. And then I'll, you know, for the next week after, I'll tell you what that'll be on. Don't worry about it. But each week, you just are responsible for a one-page paper. And then maybe two people of, of that week want to present their papers as a, as a kind of presentation. If, if this sounds awful, you can, just write, you can just write awful to me right now, and I will drop the presentation idea. But, but if you would like to do that, I'm totally cool with that. And we could, we could also start the conversation with, with like two people each week could do 
I think you really shouldn't do more than a 10, really maximum 15, but I think a 10 minute, you know, succinct presentation where again, the goal isn't to, the goal isn't to survey the whole text. The goal is like, hey, this is, this is one point I think is interesting and you just focus on that and you kind of forget the rest. Yeah, if I can ju just uh, make a point no, there that's, also. Okay, that's I mean, as, as someone who's uh, taking classes at the New Center, uh, I would say that it is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's of your benefit to do a presentation, depending on what field you're going into. I mean, I would say that they, they do work quite well. You should not feel any pressure that you have to do that, and that's why it's a very good idea to write the text. But um, if there are people who would like to give a presentation, even of just the text they write in the class, um, that's strongly encouraged. I mean, I mean, depending on what fields people are going to in the future, I mean, it can, can be of great benefit to do these things. Okay, so okay, so let's do that then. And then, what if we did like I don't? What if we do two per session? But if we do two per session, that means we would have six, which means I think there's probably ten of you. Maybe, maybe we, we can sort this out that like people who want to do a presentation can say they want to, and if somebody doesn't, like you just don't. If it turns out. There's six of you, we do six. If there's less or more, we'll just figure out a way to do that. Um, and your presentation could basically be your paper, but you could, you know, maybe you could elaborate it a little bit more, like as an oral presentation. Um, but I would like everybody, every session, to like just write me one page, you know, uh, you know, 500 words, a maximum a thousand, maximum a thousand words, something like that. Just. Just I'm happy with the one pager myself. What? Um, and to uh, interact with other, I'm happy. This is JP, by the way. Sorry. Um, personally, I'm happy with the one pager every week and working with other people's papers. I think that's adequate for me. So I'm out. Okay. Okay, that's cool. I mean, okay. Let's. So let's do this. Let's definitely do the papers. And then, how do we arrange for the? What's the Terence? What's the best way just to organize this to arrange for who's presenting which week? Oops, I I can't. I think you're muted. You're muted. For, oh wait, Could I? My, my apologies. Um, Sorry, no, I, for uh, for 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 the presentations. I mean, it, I mean, this is your, your, your kind of your your um your your uh, area here. But I mean, what I would say is that you can ask people and say, All right, who wants to give a presentation next week?" And then if no one jumps at it, then I might I would say just randomly assign people if you want minutes, but I mean hopefully there are some people in the class who are eager to do a presentation. Okay, since we all seem to be almost here, we have to consider that like there are four sessions. Uh, this is the first one almost done, and uh, we do have quite a large group. So, I mean, if no one if someone's not sure right now as well, I mean they can post it in the Google Classroom if they want to do it. But if we could get something finalized by the end of this class, yeah, okay, uh, well, we doing things next week that would be great. Because I think we're all. Are, is there anybody? Is there anybody enrolled in the class who's not here? Uh, from uh, what I can see, there are a few. I'd have to double check with the list, but we do have fourteen people in the list. And from what I can see, so there might be one or two. But I mean, I can get information to people. Uh, I'll be sending out an email immediately after this class uh, with the link to the video and a link to the um, chat box as well. So okay, well, why don't we try this? Who would let's see how this works spontaneously? Just just write. Is there anybody who would really like to do it next week? Give people a second. Okay, I think Michael's in. I would, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about the, uh, about, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll participate in that, yeah. Okay. Okay, Michael, do I have a second? I'd be happy to. Or okay. Meredith. Doesn't Meredith. Matter. Okay. Well, uh, if, or you can. Is there so it's it's uh, the life cycle so, uh, software um, object? Yeah. I mean, is there any sort of related um, psychoanalytic? Oh, just figure it out. No, figure it out. We're we're gonna figure it out. <laughs> I can say this. So I didn't. That's not required reading, but if you want, that's helpful. That actually. In that book that's in the syllabus I mentioned, um, the Stephen Shaviro's book, Discognition, there's a chapter on, um, on the Ted Chiang novel. I forget the title of the chapter, but anyway, one of the chapters, uh, I think it's like on avatars or something. Yeah. And it's very good. I mean, it's, honestly, it gives a very good analysis. It's very helpful. Um, 
we don't have to limit ourselves just to what Shaviro says, but if you want to like orient, if you want, that's an optional, you could read that chapter and that's a very good commentary, but you yeah. don't have to. No, that would be great to orient you myself. Know, if you want to talk about Shaviro in your, you know, if you really like that and you want to talk about that in your presentation, also totally cool. So can we write about the move the about Alphaville in the Black Mirror episode uh -huh. two? So this is my problem. So I want to focus. So, but that's true that I also want to cover. So let me tell you a little bit about that uh, quickly. Why I want to do that. Um, Alphaville and the Black Mirror episode two. I want to read them together. And I think it's very interesting to see that the one, I mean, just one, the Alphaville seems to, you know, Alphaville subscribes to the idea that love will destroy the machine. That the machine creates a kind of loveless world, not a desexualized world, it's a hypersexualized world, but a world in a way without love, romantic attachment, so that love will be the end of this cold machine totalitarian universe, and that the computer cannot compute love. And Black Mirror, you know, 50 years later, seems to su suggest a way in which a computer can compute love. But it computes love in a strange, in, in a strange, interesting way. So it seems to like twist around what for Godard was this very progressive and sort of romantic uh, agenda. And so that's what I was kind of interested in reading those two. Together. I know. And I think they're in a really interesting dialogue with each other in, in a funny way. Um, I want to I want to talk about so I want to talk about those two together and I want to talk about the Cheng novel because Cheng isn't immediately in in the same kind of dialogue but the Cheng raises really interesting questions about what would it mean uh, what is the relationship between artificial intelligence and love so I read those three texts those three pieces together to try to get a broader vision of of AI and love or AI and desire that's my that's my agenda or whatever that's what I'm interested in let me just think. Can we actually do both movies and the story? Maybe. Okay, let's try to do that. If that's not, since I already gave that, if that's not too much work, so I also don't want to like, I know people have plenty of other things they're doing. So I don't know if you can watch both films and the novel. So can you be specific of what two films you're talking about right uh, now? Godard, Alphaville, and the Black Mirror episode. So I sent an email that like for this class, I wanted to do Godard, Black Mirror, and the Ted Chang. Those are the three. But what I really meant is I want to do them for next week, right? Like, and I, I do want to get through the novel, but the films are, those two films are, are so those two films are in, I think just, I really want to bring out the, the kind of interesting dialogue. And I think that says a lot about our, somehow the contemporary moment. Aaron, if people only if people only have enough time to watch one of these, if they haven't watched either of them yet, which one would you recommend? Black Mirror. Black Mirror. If you only can watch one, watch the Black Mirror episode. I mean, Godard is a greater is a greater work of art. There's no doubt. But I'll just, good, I'll uh, just Black Mirror is very interesting. In case people are uh, not aware that the um, uh, Black Mirror is available on uh, Netflix for people who have Netflix subscriptions. Um, so that's a relatively easy way to view that uh, if you have a Netflix account. But the novel, I really, yeah, I, I, I also kind of went through now very carefully kind of reading through and taking notes. And I, I also want to kind of produce a reading of the novel. So I tell you what, though, let's, let's do this. If you would prefer to do, if you would prefer to do your presentation on the on the black on Black Mirror and Godard, that's cool with me. We'll talk about we'll talk about all three of those. All three of those objects are on the are on the agenda for next week. Is that okay? But if you have to prioritize, if you if you have to prioritize, I mean, go the novel first, then Black Mirror, and then Godard. Terrence, can I ask you a quick question? Sorry, just of course. a technical question. At the end of the class, like, because people, you guys are sometimes writing some side comments or like posting links. When the class is over, can I can can one see all of those? Yeah, that's 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 a good question. Um, so what happens is uh, I'm taking charge of this chat box. 
So don't worry about it. I'm always taking a note of it. It'll all be copy and pasted into the Google Classroom and everything's uh, documented cool. there. Okay, cool. Because cool. I just saw like somebody posted a long. Okay, that's cool. Because no, okay. some of the links there'll, there'll be a YouTube link posted as well. I'll send this by, out an email. It'll also be in the Google Classroom. And um, of course, because there's so many different things being talked about today, uh, you can watch the video back. It's in the archives, but also a YouTube link will be posted. Hey, there's a um, Mikey Wells who wasn't roll called, and so he just read his introduction. But maybe he can. Oh, okay, that's but you. Okay. There was another. Is there another person here? Oh, sorry, I didn't think, maybe Mikey wasn't uh, logged in at that point. Very sorry about that. Mikey, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, hey, okay. okay. so we're almost kind of finished, but do you want to do a quick, uh, we introduce ourselves and such. Do you want to just do a little spiel? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was wondering if I got to get skipped over, but <laughs> uh, there's a lot of Michaels in classes, which happens. Um, but yeah, I wrote my introduction. Uh, goes over most of it, but basically I, I live out here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I run a theory bookstore working uh, on publishing out here and based online. And my background in philosophy is mostly informal. Um, I read a lot of like kind of anarchist political theory when I was in high school, uh, mm -hmm. going to public shows and things like that. So, which I encountered uh, anti Oedipus, which was like, you know, opened up this whole world of philosophy. And ever since then, I, you know, used kind of Blues and Guattari as kind of a springboard and uh, branched off into many directions um, and used that as a background to my other work, uh, mostly in the culinary field, um, where I was a chef for 10 years and worked mm -hmm. in like high and fine dining around the world. And um, now I work as a coffee educator uh, as kind of my job that pays the bills right now. So teach kind of everything from barista skills to oh. uh, sensory uh, experiences. And then, and then um, uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm in the store and I'm moving towards that and taking more of a, you know, serious, you know, branching out with theory and philosophy and trying to integrate more with you. Uh, so, but yeah, this class is really just me. Um, AI has always been, uh, very big for sorry, uh, Mikey. Can I ask you sorry, just for a moment. Uh, do you have your laptop speakers on? Because we're getting a little bit of feedback. I don't. I don't know. It seems to be okay now. So sorry. Sorry to uh, break your flow there. Oh, it's okay. Um, but yeah, so I've just had. I've always loved sci-fi, and AI has always been really interesting to me. Um, and it's used a lot for me framing a lot of my thought for my work in theory and also just like my work in uh you know the culinary field as well and kind of a just like speculative field of kind of like what if um so i'm really interested to see you know it applied to other senses but I'm, I'm kind of returning to applying theory to food which i've i've always kept those lives separate in a way um so Taste and smell is something that's been very separated from uh, in philosophy writings and also like science fiction. So it's like the senses that are kind of skipped over, breezed over really quickly. And so I'm really interested in like exploring that more from a like philosophical standpoint. And also, um, you know, how that could also be thought of more in terms of like artificial intelligence or, um, you know, eyes of for ideas in consciousness and like in, uh, in humanism. But yeah, so I'm excited to see what this class can bring to that discussion and build off or just totally push me uh, off the rails on that kind of track. So, What's what's the bookstore? What's the bookstore uh, called? Uh, Aleatory Books. Aleatory Books, cool. Yeah. Have you been doing that for a while or is that new? Uh, it started beginning of this year. Uh, so, you know, getting close to a year now. Um, just basically started because that's collecting too many books that's first trying to figure out a way to like get rid of some. Uh, but then it kind of brought on a lot of new projects and I formed a lot of great connections around the world. That's how I got in contact with uh, Jason at New Center and um, it's kind of led me to different like educational opportunities and um, different kind of speaking events and uh, you know I'm throwing a lot of events um, around. I'm actually bringing Reza out here uh, in a couple of months to give a talk. So it's been it's been a lot of fun and 
you know, launching new projects, starting publishing and things like that. So. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to... Okay. All right, so maybe we conclude. Uh, is that clear then? I'll send an email to, I'll just send an email to everyone just restating what I said about, uh, you know, please write a paper. This is what we're doing on, on uh, for next Monday. And, uh, but is that all clear? And then uh, Michael Meredith will do the presentations. Um, yeah. If there's any uh, burning questions or any points that people want to raise, I mean, we're you know, we there's no there's no uh, cutoff points here exactly. So I mean, don't feel like things are being cut too short. So if anyone has any points they want yeah, to, raise, all the, yeah. I don't. Uh, but thank you, everybody. We shall see you on Monday. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Bye. Okay, Bye. thanks everybody. I'll send out an email. Bye everyone. Class. Bye. All right, and thanks thanks again very much to Aaron for a wonderful first session. Okay, I'm looking forward to seeing how things develop. Anyway, okay. Me too, me too. Take care. Bye.